All right, and we are live. Welcome to the Bloodstream. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, go ahead and get out of the way before I bring on my guest tonight. Um, if you have any questions for Dave, please please try to hold on to those until uh, the end of the stream. We are going to try and do a Q&A toward the end of tonight. So try and hold on to those questions or please feel free to send them via a super chat. That way, of course, that helps out the channel and YouTube keeps an archive of all those. So um, they're very easily uh, uh, referred to when we get to the Q&A portion of tonight's show. So uh, let's see who is with us so far here. Let me give a couple of shout outs. We've got my buddy Dan in the chat. What's up, Captain Halloween Keith? What's up, Christian? Todd Farmer's in the chat. Todd, how are you doing, man? Good to see you. Uh, Luke Ledbetter, Sam Thomason, Michael Sullivan. Thank y'all for uh, for being here so far. Appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Let's go ahead and get the ball rolling here. My guest tonight is a writer, an editor, a producer, and a director, and also just an all-around nice fella. Dave Parker joins me tonight for the Bloodstream. Dave, how you doing, man? Hey, I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Uh, what, what an intro you got, you have on this thing. That's just that's epic. Well, thank you. <laughs> that's I, really I thank cool. You. I'm I like, appreciate you did that. that music. That music's great. That's actually a buddy of mine named uh, Jaxius. Okay. He has, a, he has a channel on YouTube. He does some really killer music, and uh, he allows me to uh, use them. So, that's awesome really awesome yeah. music but yeah, yeah great back, to be here thank you for having me on yeah right on man it's uh it, it's a pleasure you know you're a you're a name that um kind of keeps popping up in, in one form or another i think most horror fans have probably seen something that you've been associated with and may not have known that you were associated with it probably more um, that. <laughs> <laughs> probably more of that like who is this <laughs> But uh, yeah, you've been around. You've been in the in the business for thirty years at this point, something like that. That's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> Time flies, right? Yeah, flies. yeah, it sure does. Yeah, I have been you, in the business for a long time. It feels like. But you know, I've, I've had a lot of I've had a number of directors on uh, for one of these, and I, I've never asked them. And I know you're a big movie buff yourself. Mm -hmm. but have you seen any good movies lately? Uh, yeah, I just, uh, I watched, uh, the new chainsaw movie and I enjoyed that a hell of a lot. I had a hell of a good time with that, that uh, as far as I'm concerned, delivered on its title for me. So, um, I thought they did a really good job of making me really hate the characters that I wanted to see die. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. I know you're supposed to like sympathize with them and I did with the, 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 the last girl and everything, but yeah, I had a really good time with that. Um, and then North by Northwest is the the last movie I actually watched. So, uh, but that's that's a little that's a little older. So, yeah. But that's pretty great. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I, I really enjoyed the new Chainsaw too. Yeah, I mean, it definitely lived up to its title, and uh, I, I just thought it was a, a hell of a lot of fun. Yeah, and that, that's really all I wanted out of it was fun, and I thought it was a great fun. It exceeded my expectations greatly, and I'm dying to see. Uh, and I'll, I'll go see it this week. Is uh, Studio Six Six Six? Yes. Uh, yes. My friend BJ uh, directed that, so I'm excited to uh, check that out. Oh, cool! Yeah, I hear really uh, good things. I'm gonna try and sneak in a double feature uh, sometime this week of Studio Six 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 and The Cursed, which I'm hearing I really hear, good things I, about. Yeah, it. I hear that. That's really good too. I would like to see that as well. Yeah. So, and, and I'm really, really looking forward to X, the new Ty West film. Yeah, that looks fun. So, that, yeah. that came out of nowhere. I'm like, wait, when did he, you know, he's been doing TV so much. So I was like, oh, I didn't know he was making a new movie. So yeah, and that looks like a blast. So that looks like a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 We've also got Rolf Konevsky in the chat tonight. How oh, you doing, Rolf? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Rolf. <laughs> but let's, uh, let's, let's go back to, uh, to the beginning here a little bit i understand you grew up in vermont is that right? i did yes i grew up outside of burlington which is like the main the big city in vermont mm -hmm. um in a town called richmond and uh yeah uh grew up there and uh, Pr pretty far up. from pretty far from tinseltown yeah uh, i grew up on a farm uh so uh yeah 
was, it was, it was, uh, it was was great. Uh, I skied, I did all that, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, but very early on, I was always fascinated by California. I mean, even as I was a kid, I remember being at my grandparents and they, and uh, my cousin, she had just come back from universal studios and they were showing me pictures of that. And I was like, Oh, I got to go there. I want to go there. I didn't know what, jaws was or anything like that but i was like this place looks amazing so yeah there's so, something yeah, about there was always some fascination with uh of, of this yeah there's yeah i, I agree they're, they're definitely i think the further the further east you get from it there seems to be more of like a magic to it yeah. but then but then when you talk to somebody who lives out there they're like yeah there's no magic here oh there is <laughs> there's magic here you just gotta you know you, you know you, you know you get uh seduced by it early on and then you you get your heart broken a couple times and then you have to start finding where the magic is. And then when, once you do that, it's, it's still, you know, and you can't beat the weather. Right. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. the coldest it gets is like in the thirties ever. I, I'm definitely <laughs> not, I'm, not I'm, even like freezing, but yeah. I'm definitely uh, envious of you. It's been really nasty and dreary and just blah here in Kentucky for the past week or so. And it's just, suck the life right out of me yeah but do, do you remember when you were first introduced to the horror genre uh yeah uh funny i remember i mean i remember before uh i remember my mom getting me famous monsters of film land the magazine before i could read i just liked the pictures mm-hmm. um i think it was like a star wars cover so she didn't think it was monsters and stuff like that. But my mom was a really big universal monsters fan. Um, so I'm sure she showed me a little bit of those that, you know, that was the time before VHS where you had to catch them on TV when they played. So mm-hmm. it wasn't like super easy to see them all the time. Um, so I was again, like so many of us, I was instantly, you know, into monsters and dinosaurs. Um, and then I remember, I remember my dad taking us to see Grizzly in the theater. <laughs> and that was, uh, that was a very vivid, um, very vivid memory. Cause I, I remember I, I sat in the, the very front row of the theater and my, my dad sat back. So I was sitting with my brother, but when I would get scared, I'd go run up and sit by him. <laughs> so I was going back and forth in this theater with, with Grizzly. Um, so that was probably, that was probably it. But funny enough, a lot of the time, when I was younger, horror movies really, really scared me and I would have nightmares really easily. So uh, I didn't go to uh, a lot of what were considered the modern horror movies at the time. There's no way I could have ever like survived seeing Alien or The Exorcist. Or, I, mm. I've been so scarred for life at, at, at such a young age. But I remember in 82 when Creepshow came out and that was the first one I was like, dad we're going to see this opening night i have to see this i i don't know what it was it, it, it was just it just had everything that i liked or at least i thought it just looked amazing so yeah so i would say it's all george romero and stephen king's fault <laughs> so. <clears throat> and then again and then right after that was when vhs uh, you know that era and then it was just right. renting it was just renting everything. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, uh, well, I should say almost everything. There were certain movies that I, you know, at the time that I never saw because I thought the box looked lame. Uh, and uh, and I have now since seen some of these movies. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, there's a reason why I didn't watch this back then. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't it was good. Um, so, it's, so it wasn't an issue of like, you know, your, your, your folks tried to shield you from certain movies. Well... Uh, there was a t- yeah my mom didn't want me running a friday the 13th movie when part mm-hmm. three came out and that was the first one that i actually saw uh she really didn't want me running that um and she forbid me from renting texas chainsaw the fir- the original mm-hmm. um so i had to wait till she went out of town and then i went right to the video store and rented it <laughs> that <laughs> watched it in broad daylight and had the shit scared out of me see chainsaw was the only movie that i couldn't rent even after mom kind of 
even after she 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 lowered her defenses in Friday the Thirteenth and Nightmare, and all those were fine to rent. Chainsaw was still like dangerous. off limits. Yeah, yeah dangerous. I, I I remember her saying, "Yeah, I'm I, I'm not going to let you watch a movie about people being killed with a chainsaw." Right, right. But you know, machetes and, when you see and axes and exactly. arrows. That, that's fine. That's perfectly um, fine. Yeah. So then, of course, when you see the film, you go. Wait a minute. There's hardly any blood in this, but that's part of the the magic of of chainsaw, really. Absolutely. Uh, but the 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 reason why my mom forbid me to see the movie was my oldest brother when he was in college saw the movie at his college theater. Uh, I think this was still the seventies. Maybe it was a couple two three years after it had been released. And he would tell me he would tell me about the movie, but. Also, someone started a chainsaw up in the theater and caused a stampede out of the theater. Oh, wow. So it's this notorious, you know, thing that happened. So he would he would start telling me about it. And it just really, like, upset my mom. So she was like, there is no way, no way you're seeing that movie. <laughs> so, um, yeah. But after a while, they just have... You know, at first, I think they were concerned. I think they're like, why is this kid running all this horror and blood and guts and stuff like that? And the, the irony is, you know, you know, my mom and my brothers were, you know, they were reading Stephen King and they were reading all this horror stuff, Amityville horror. They were reading any, you know, popular thing. And they're like, why? why? So when, I, but I guess I just got so into it. They eased up once they um, started to understand that I was interested in the technical and the, the, the special effects and the technical aspects of filmmaking, which is, you know, why I was renting this stuff. And they were like, we well, can't, I, I want, but the thing is I watched anything. I watched any genre. I didn't care that I just, my go-to was, was horror though. So, but they eased up a little bit. Was there a particular movie that you saw that, that made you go, that's what I want to do. Creep show. Oh. It was creep show and Raiders of the lost Ark. It was those two. Because Raiders also had this TV special about the the great stunts of Raiders of the Lost Ark. They had this whole making of thing that you could see. Mm. And I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> that. Little did I know. <laughs> little did I know that it was much harder than uh, Steven Spielberg makes it look. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you decided that you wanted to head out west to make mm -hmm. your dream a reality, was there any pushback from your folks? Yeah. Because I only, uh, when I applied to colleges, I only applied to NYU, USC, and UCLA. And mm. they were like, why wouldn't you apply for a college here just as a backup? And I said, because I don't want a backup. And I got into USC. So it was like, okay. There really wasn't much say about it. I was going to go regardless. It was like, uh, you know, I was I was 18 and I was, I was ready to... I was ready to, you know, start living, yeah. to, you know, start trying, start trying to do this. So, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know you, you attended film school for a short time and there's, yeah. there's, there's, there seems to be two schools of thought when it comes to film school that, you know, you, it, the positives are you learn your trade, you get hands on with the equipment and you network. Yeah. So there's, but then there's a whole other camp of people who say, just take the money and go make a movie. You're not going to learn how to make a movie until you literally go make a movie. Just take the money and go make a movie. Well, I don't know if I would give that exact advice to take the money and go make your own movie. Um, yeah, I only I only went to USC for a year, and one of it was a financial thing because even then it was incredibly expensive. Um, but I remember, you know, I didn't get into the production side of uh, film school right away freshman year, so it was going to take longer and so we were taking film study classes and I was just kind of acing them because I, I'd watched so many movies and I had read books already and I knew this stuff. And honestly, my professor was like, you know, it's, it's so difficult to get into the production film school. And, you know, USC is a school that really tries to um, gear people towards the studio system. And I know the types of movies that you like that are a little more independent. It's like, not that you don't want to make studio movies, but you'd be better off going and getting a job working on a movie. 
So the next year, that's what I did. And I learned more on that short shooting schedule of a movie uh, that Jeff Burr was directing than I did. Uh, Eddie Presley? Yeah, it was Eddie Presley. So, um, and the thing is, uh, you know, Jeff really like kind of took me under his wing and and explained and showed me a lot. It was, it was really great. And through him, I met uh, people like Courtney Joyner, who's a screenwriter and was getting ready to direct at that time. I met uh, Darren Scott, who's a really good friend who did, who does the tales from the hood movies. Um, At that time, I, I was hanging out with Quentin a little bit, Tarantino, uh, because he had, when we were making Eddie Presley, he had, was just finishing shooting Reservoir Dogs. And he did a cameo in Eddie Presley with Bruce Campbell. So, yeah, it was a, it was a really interesting time, like with all these sort of indie, indie people. But uh, yeah, they, uh, they definitely uh, gave me a, a pretty decent education. More than, so I don't know if you, need to spend your own money to make a movie, but going and working on a movie, whether it's a PR or not, you're going to learn a lot. Mm. Mm. Was it, uh, your transition from Vermont to LA? Was it, um, uh, was it difficult? Any, any culture shock going on there? No, funny enough. No, I felt right at home when I got here. Um, I mean, you had to be smarter what areas you went into and everything, you know, places mm-hmm. like that. And you had to be smart about things, but no, I felt instantly like, yeah, this is where I belong. Um, which was weird because I was expecting coming from a small town and everything to, to be kind of overwhelmed, but absolutely not. Which was, which was strange. Um, I mean, it was difficult. There were lean times. I came out with 400 bucks to my name and, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, you know, was sleeping on floors and, stuff like that for, for a while until I got, you know, my, my footing. But, uh, but I was really lucky because uh, when I had gone to USC, I made a couple contacts while I was here, uh, which was the year before. And one of those was uh, a guy named Chaz Ballin. He had, he did this magazine called deep red and uh He's the one who actually, I, I called him, told him that I had just moved into town officially. And then he called me right back and goes, you know, I just talked to Jeff Burr. He's getting ready to do this movie. You should call him up. Here's, here's a number to the office. I was like, wow. So within two weeks of being here, I had a job. Wow. So that was lucky. Yeah. That's very, very cool. Yeah. When, when I first announced that I was doing one of these with you, I thought all the questions would be Uwe Boll related. <laughs> they weren't. Honestly, nobody's asked me a thing about Uwe Boll. Everybody wants to know about Richard Band. When Charlie did you Band. Charlie, Charlie Band, I'm sorry, Richard Charlie Band's Band. his brother, the the, the composer. Yeah, the composer. When, when did you first link up with Charlie Band? Um, okay. So I was I was I finished working on Eddie Presley and um through a couple of connections that I met there, um, I was introduced to this guy named Daniel Schweiger, who was the head of promotions, which means he cut all the trailers and he was cutting the video zones. And so I would go over and to the full moon offices, which were in Hollywood at the time, and just kind of hang out and talk with them and stuff like that. And I got to know him. And then I was working on these, uh, a couple of really low budget uh, movies uh, with my friend Jay Wolfel. Uh, and he started to show me how to edit. And this was, this was if you, uh, two giant three quarter inch decks and like, uh, you know, it was total analog editing, but he showed me how to, you know, how to do simple editing. Um, which I'm really grateful for. Um, And then eventually, so I just started, you know, being over at full moon a little bit. And then uh, Dan was finally looking for an assistant. So he asked me actually two assistants. He asked me and, uh, and my friend JJ Hummel and we started assisting and just, that's, that's how it began. Um, And it was, it was kind of an amazing place even in Hollywood, it was really cool. Um, you know, you walk in and, and, and the thing is 
the great thing is that everyone was accessible. Everyone was friendly. Um, they were busy. This was right around the time that they were shooting the subspecies sequels, two and three back to back in Romania. Mm. Um, and then they were getting ready to do uh, Trancers three, I think, or they had just done Trancers three. So it was that era of, it was still Charlie, you know, connected with Paramount and, and doing, you know, doing these movies and shooting them all on 35 film. I remember you know, <laughs> getting selects for, for the subspecies, two or three trailer and having to reel to reel with the, with the, with the, the, the footage and, and cut out sections, you know, so those could get transferred and then you'd have to cut them back in, you know, exactly right back into the, into the work reel and stuff like that. It was nerve wracking <laughs> because if you messed it up, then things are out of sync and it was, it would just be uh, a mess. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, on any given day, you know, Stuart Gordon's there, Ted Nicolau, you know, all the, all the directors and the writers, everyone was there. You know, Charlie was Charlie and his wife, Debbie Dion at the time, they were, in, they were completely accessible. So it was like a family business then. Absolutely. You know, it was, you know, you learn why you earn for the young people that were there. And it was, it, it was great. You wore a number of different hats there, right? Well, again, I started, I started as, um, the promotions assistant and, and I did that for quite a while. Um, and then, you know, we started shooting, I started doing segments, particular segments of the video zone myself. They were handed off to me. Um, and then Dan would like have me do like first passes on trailers and then he would come and revise it or fix it and. So I did that for for a good couple of years uh, because it was also, you know, we're shooting behind the scenes. We're going to the sets, you know, that we're shooting here, not Romania. Um, and at that time, it was like, well, here's Courtney Joyner, who's a friend. He's he's there making a movie and there's Jeff Burr and he's making, you know, Puppet Master four and five. So it's like, again, these are all the people that I was hanging out with at the time. Um, so. Yeah, uh, it was really cool. And then eventually, because I mean, the minute I, <laughs> the minute I got there, I basically told Charlie that I wanted to direct someday. So he knew, so he knew how to dangle that carrot for a long time. Um, but then he would start having me do like some simple second unit stuff on a couple things. And then you know, through the years. And then I, I did like some additional shooting on craw the sea monster, <laughs> <laughs> which we did, which is funny enough. Uh, it's one of Alison Lohman's I cast Alison Lohman. It was one of her first things. And it was this like really piss poor <laughs> power Rangers type section that was crammed into this movie that didn't have it before. It was just like, Oh God, I didn't write it. I was just like happy to direct anything. Uh, so well, we I mean, did that. Well, well, I mean, full moon was such a, yeah. You know, if you grew up in the video store era, that, that time, you know, full moon was huge. I remember first hearing about full moon on like entertainment tonight, entertainment tonight was doing a full piece on full moon. Right. And, you know, they had that, that, that partnership with Paramount and they were rolling out all the, all the puppet master movies. Everything was a, was a puppet or like a, a, a tiny creature the or, or toys or something. And, something. And, there was always some sort of thing or seed people. There was a, but that was the thing. And Charlie's whole mantra was I'm making, uh, the comic books of the nineties, live mm -hmm. action comic books. Uh, and you know, so much of the stuff was inspired by, inspired by, you know, comics. He had a huge uh pretty insane comic collection uh, you know at one time uh that was incredibly you know valuable i mean like i'm sure he probably had superman number one and you know these type of it was like of that level um so yeah and, and then the thing was that because he came out with posters and little things little uh, trading cards and all these things mm -hmm. early on every video store put them up. Mm -hmm. So you were constantly seeing them everywhere. What was, you know, 
Charles Band's kind of an, an infamous character at this point. What was uh, what was it like working for him, or 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 can you describe what it was like working for Charlie Band? I mean, there's been obviously there are a lot of people who have a lot of bad things to say about Charlie, and it's like, oh, he bounced a check, or he didn't pay me, or he didn't do this, and he screwed me over, or this or that, or whatever. Um, yes, there were times that not bounced a check, but there were times where our checks were delayed and, and stuff like that. And that would get frustrating, but like, it wasn't like got delayed like a month. We hadn't got paid. It was like a week. So, um, but he was incredibly nice to me. Uh, he and his wife, uh, you know, just so generous, um, gave me a lot of opportunities um that i had a great time and you know and the thing was you know every week we would have a meeting with all the department heads you know and and talk about everything everything again everything was so open and it really was a family and you would just you'd go around the offices and talk to people and uh, you know at the time i was working there um steve bloom who is now a huge voiceover artist worked there um, and I actually started having him do some of the voiceovers for video zone and stuff like that in the beginning. And that was sort of kind of his first voiceover stuff. Um, and now he's like, he's done everything like, you know, he's done Wolverine and, you know, Batman, you know, animated stuff like the highest animated stuff you could be in, you know, he's in. So that's kind of crazy. Um, yeah, it's it was just, but uh, but yeah, Charlie never got Charlie never got mad. <laughs> you know, he he never he never shouted, never screamed, uh was never you know um at times you know, maybe unfair, <laughs> you know, where it's just like, uh, it's like oh, come on, but ultimately I I really, you know, uh a lot of people have, I guess, more complaints. I, I'm just, you know, I'm grateful for the opportunities, uh, you know, that were that were given and the and the and the chances too. So, I, I've always pictured sorry, him as guys. Kind of... <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm not giving you the dirt. There was one, there was one time. Okay, there was one time. Uh, this is a little dirt, and you know, he didn't pay us one week. And he got a Dodge Viper delivered to the fucking studio. And it, was like, <laughs> and it was like, you're stupid, man. You're really dumb. Someone's going to fucking key your car or something like that. It was just like, really, Charlie? Really? Uh, yeah. so I, I, I've always pictured him as kind of like a, a mini Roger Corman in that, you know, you can make a movie, sure, as long as you keep it under this budget. You've got to have X amount of nudity and X amount of action and X amount of, you know what I mean? And if you keep it under this budget... Well, then we're we're guaranteed to turn a profit. It, I mean, it wasn't quite that simple. Uh, it was a, it was a little more calculated, and, and that was the one thing Charlie came up with all the titles. Uh, he he would he would he would come up every year. He would come up with titles and artwork, and then you'd go write the script. You know, he would come up with the concept first and everything, and then you and then he would you know divvy out the script to screenwriters. So that's how he worked. Um, so you couldn't just go pitch him anything. And at the time he had no interest in doing any like slasher movie stuff. He, he's, a, he was like, you know, tourist, tourist trap would be considered the most slashery movie he's probably done. And he didn't consider a slasher movie because there was the supernatural element. Um, but yeah, uh, it wasn't quite that easy. I mean, you could pitch him ideas, but most of them came from him, <laughs> but he was, he was open to like, Hey, what if you did this or, you know, this with that? And it was like, Oh, okay. And sometimes he would do it and take the credit for it. <laughs> well, for, <laughs> for all the, uh, for all the puppet master fans in the chat, mm -hmm. tell us about puppet wars and okay. why that trilogy didn't happen. Okay. So this was around, I want to say, maybe 94, 95 at some point. Uh, I was working with, again, Jay Wolfel, uh, and we were, we, we, 
we did a we did a spec thing, which uh, I thought could possibly be turned into a Seed People sequel. Um, so we kind of changed the script that we wrote and made it a little more for that, and showed it to um, Charlie's wife Debbie, and she liked it, but there was going to be no plans to make Seed People too. So they were like. That's not going to happen. But then they, uh, but then they had us do a rewrite on a script and we did that and uh, they liked that. Um, and then they came up with this idea and presented it. It was, it was, would you like to come up with uh, a three movie arc? called Puppet Wars that would be the further adventures of Andre Toulon during World War II. So a jumping off point from Puppet Master 3. Even though they were making 4 and 5, they wanted to do a whole separate series for Paramount that would just be centered in World War II. And we were like, yeah, of course. So with the help of Courtney Joyner, who was kind of our mentor overseeing screenwriter to sort of guide us because he had written puppet master three um we wrote three <laughs> i've looked at these you know in the past couple of years and it was like these are giant movies i don't know what we were thinking <laughs> it was <laughs> huge but um the first one was going to be called curse of the puppet master um and that one was sort of, it's a, it was a little bit like um, Horror Express. It was set mainly on a train. Mm -hmm. And there was an Egyptian element to it. Because what we decided we were going to do is kind of have the puppets and, every, uh, and Toulon kind of versus the classic monsters in a way. So in that one, um, that was sort of a, a mummy Anubis type thing. Uh, the second one, uh, I don't remember it. I don't remember the names <laughs> now. I'd have to look. The second one dealt with vampires. Uh, and like, uh, uh, I don't think, if, I don't know if it was Dracula specific, but definitely vampires. But it wasn't, like, it was not a subspecies crossover. I was going to say, did, it did was they not it? that, which would have been, would have made sense to have the puppets fight those little subspecies guys would have been mm -hmm. pretty mm -hmm. awesome. Um, and then the third one, had a Frankenstein element to it. Um, the the villain, one of the villains was, you know, rebuilt into a sort of friend. But man, these things were huge. It, it was just like so much puppet action. I had six shooter with with um, stakes, like six stakes going after <laughs> vampires and all this stuff. I remember it was just like, and I'm reading it again going, what were we thinking? But anyway, so we wrote all three of them and that was at Paramount at the time. But what happened was um, the Paramount deal dissolved. Uh, mm. Right. Right. He was uh, Charlie was in prep for a movie called Ragdoll before it became the Ragdoll that he did make, which actually wasn't a Ragdoll, which is kind of funny when you look at that movie and it's called Ragdoll. <laughs> <laughs> um and we had worked on a, a treatment for a rag doll at one point as well. Uh, but um, it, it's um, yeah, it, it, that project just died with Paramount. Paramount paid and owned the scripts. Mm. So it just, and, and never mind the fact that, you know, ultimately we, they would have, we would have had to cut the budgets, cut so much of the scripts out, you know, there would have been no way to actually, you know, <laughs> <laughs> filmed these things they were so i mean uh you know david allen was still alive then and this was great because around around this time um we had moved from hollywood we expanded we had hollywood offices and then we were filming in like culver city which is down a ways kind of kind of near santa monica in that area um but then charlie got this place in atwater city glendale which was a, just a little ways away, but it had two sound stages. It had a post-production building. It had the office building. And then it had uh, another building, uh, you know, sections for 
uh, the makeup effects lab and for David Allen to have his own lab. So it was crazy because you could walk to, you know, any of these places. It was like, <laughs> there were times when, you know, I would get a call, I'd be editing. I get a call and it's David Allen going, Hey, come check out the shot I just did. And he was working on primevals at the time. So I'm watching him do stop motion animation for primevals. It was amazing. Uh, there was a time also that, uh, you know, Charlie was doing a lot of uh, kids movies too. He was mm -hmm. doing the moonbeam stuff along with the, the soft core stuff, which was Torchlight and surrender. Uh, so there was never a dull moment <laughs> at that place walking around. You just didn't know, what, you know, what, what were you going to walk into either, exactly. <laughs> either, either a soft core scene or, you know, here's, you know, little tiny dinosaurs. <laughs> you just never knew. Um, but Randy, Randy William Cook, who worked on the Lord of the Rings uh, and directed second unit on Peter Jackson's King Kong also worked there. He had directed a movie there called for, it was a, Disney acquired it called Demon in a Bottle. And I remember, you know, he was literally like the office right across from me. And he would call me in and he was working on, and I hadn't seen really anything like a digital character. It was the bottle stopper on this genie lamp. And it was him. He modeled after his face and he animated it. It was incredible before character animation of like that was massively huge so it's no surprise but again here's the guy who you know went on to win three oscars for lord of the rings it, it mm. was it, again you just never knew who who would be there mm. do you have any idea why the the full moon paramount thing ended um i have a couple guesses um well one one uh his main his main partner conduit at paramount left mm -hmm. that was one of the reasons so what was happening was uh paramount was profiting more and more and charlie was getting less and less but also charlie and he even says this in his new autobiography you know he would sort of like get money for one project that hadn't been made yet to help pay for something else he goes but that's mm -hmm. the way I, he always did it um and i don't know if he just got like two too ahead of himself and paramount was like no no, no wait, wait, wait a minute you know we paid you money for this movie that you haven't even shot yet so it could have been it could be that i don't know exactly but i i think it was a combo of of things like that because mm. yeah, there was a there was a definite there was a definite uh, I don't, I don't know. Quality I, drop. Well, I was going to say, <laughs> I was trying to think of a nice way of putting it. It was a downgrade yeah. after, after the, after Paramount, they had that split. There was definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. The budgets yeah. got less, uh, which meant the production value and the schedules got shorter and more corners were cut. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was a rough time. I mean, but out of that, we got castle freak was after Paramount. So we did get, we did get a couple really, you know, pretty cool, interesting movies. And then they were still doing stuff in Romania. Oblivion was a big one mm. too, but uh, yeah, it was definitely, it was definitely different <laughs> when, <laughs> when Paramount left. Yeah. Uh, oh, Major Jay Wolfel is in the room listening. Uh, hey Jay, how you doing? Jay Wolfel also directed uh, Beyond Dreams Door, which is on Shutter now beautifully beautifully remastered and great um yeah so and yeah jay wrote puppet wars i think if you go to, actually if you go and jay you can let people know in the chat sorry um i think you can actually read the puppet wars scripts on his website which i believe is jaywolfel.com i think he's got all three of them that you can read there oh very cool and you can see some uh because jay was going to direct curse of the puppet master so there's like conceptual art of, of the creatures and stuff that we're going to have in that first one. Mm, very cool. Very cool. You made your directorial debut, at least according to IMDb. <laughs> it's not a directorial debut. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, it, it's a, ra <laughs> a, a rather auspicious oh, yeah. debut with a film entitled Bimbo <laughs> Movie Bash. It, it, it's a it, it's a breath. It's a breathtaking piece of work. Please tell us about it. 
Um, uh, at that time, Charlie was getting into interactive CD-ROM games. And because he had these clips, he kind of made this sort of like edit your own bimbo movie. And he took all these <laughs> clips from these things and he called it bimbo movie bash. And he's like, Oh, we should, we should do a companion movie. And um, so it naturally fell to me because it was like, here's the schmuck who has access to all our movies and stuff like that. And it's like, and he wants to direct. Um, so he called me in to do it. And I said, well, I'm really going to need help with this. So I asked my friend, Mike Mendez to, to come help me edit this thing and our initial thing was you know Char it wasn't going to be a compilation movie like charlie had done in the past like famous tna or or, or you know uh those things um it, he wanted he wanted us to take you know all these movies and and fashion a story out of it and at the time we were like well yeah we can do this uh if you but what we want to do is we want to redub all the voices kind of like what's up tiger lily mm. i was like oh no you can't do the whole thing maybe you can do a couple voices but you can't you can't do it all which severely hindered us and he wanted it to be a takeoff of independence day in a way mm. so we gave it a shot <laughs> and it was just it's uh wow um I don't think I've watched it in God knows uh, 20 years. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't have a copy of it anywhere. I, um, I watched, I watched it for you the whew, other night. It's whew. on, it's on Tubi. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if I want, I, I, I don't think I, 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 at one point I did kind of fast forward through some of it, but <laughs> um, <laughs> it's uh, it, 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 I mean, it literally is a make your own bimbo movie yeah. with with voiceovers and there, there's a couple of jokes in there that are that are kind of funny uh, and i mean you've got Maybe. you've got you've got scenes involving adrian barbeau and you've bill, got maher. bill maher julie strain uh yeah. liz liz caton a lot of familiar Blake, oh Rick yeah I, I, any, anyone who was in a full moon movie <laughs> <laughs> exactly you know, basically or a, or a surrender cinema torchlight you know movie you know anything anything that had a uh you know a UFO, bad channels. We, I know we we use bad channels. Anything with an alien, I think we use, you know, stuff. Uh, but <laughs> oh my god, I I I, I, I cannot really. Remember. I couldn't tell you one joke or anything from that thing. But it's it's yeah. odd that they gave you guys like a directing because I mean, really, it's, it's more it, it's more of an editing job than a directing. Yeah, but job. the thing is, I guess they they it is an editing job. And I think they gave us the credit because they had to put it on a box and they didn't want it to look like it wasn't an all new movie. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, and he, uh, he, you know, and the funny thing is he came up with that poster and it made entertainment weekly. <laughs> I was just like, <laughs> I was just like, and Charlie's all excited. It's like, you made it into entertainment. Weekly? I'm like, great. <laughs> your, I said, no, Charlie, your poster made it into Entertainment Weekly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and well, I mean, what was Entertainment Weekly saying about the bimbo movie bash? Oh, it's like, look at this crazy movie. Look at this crazy thing. And this, this is what it is. It was just a description of the movie, and and Charlie being a, a an insane person <laughs> for for doing this. So we're uh, we're joined by another filmmaker here in the chat. Jamie Blanks is with us. Oh man, that's Thank a real you, filmmaker. What are you talking about? <laughs> What am I doing here? <laughs> Hope you're doing well, Jamie. Yeah, man. Um, let's talk about the dead hate the living. I, Do we have I, to? For, yes, let's, <laughs> yes, listen, listen, there's a lot of, listen, uh, you, you we'll, we'll talk about this later. You, you downplay your own stuff. Look, Todd you, Farmer, Rolf, and Jay. Um, and I think my brother is watching this too. So. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be careful now. Uh, yeah, they'll all attest that I, I, I am, uh, I'm the biggest fan of my own work. <laughs> but see, I, I, I remember first seeing the movie in the early, or renting it in the early 2000s because I loved the, the the artwork on the box. I thought it was awesome. Yeah, but but I kind of looked at it like because you know we mentioned there had been a drop in quality since Full Moon split with Paramount. So oh yeah. I'm not sure what expectations I had for the film, but it was a zombie movie. 
there weren't a lot of zombies. There wasn't a lot of zombie stuff going on at the time. No, and... this was before Resident Evil. Mm-hmm. But the, not the video game, but before the first movie. Exactly. And I remember, I remember th- thinking like, this is really, this is really ambitious for a full moon movie. Cause it's a movie kind of about a movie that takes place within like, I mean, clearly you're a Lucio Fulci fan. Uh, just a little. So <laughs> like no, when, no when one I, else was, you know, no one else seemed to be at the time. <laughs> When I'm watching a full moon movie and I'm getting Lucio Fulci references out of a full moon movie, I'm going, okay, whoever made this movie knows their stuff. This is, this isn't just, this is a horror fan making this movie. So that kind of got me yeah. even more into it. And um, I, I went back and I revisited it a few days ago. And aside from it being a little slow in the beginning, I think it's a, a kick-ass, little, I think a it's a kick-ass slow. movie. I think uh, the, the the effects are fantastic um i love again i love how ambitious it was well thank you uh yeah it was one of those things where i I don't know i think i had like a stick up my ass about full moon at the time in a way where i was just sort of like i'm gonna make the most unfull moon movie ever there's not gonna be there's not gonna be no short tiny zombies or anything like that this is gonna be totally different and for better or worse uh charlie just let me go uh now granted let me go with one hundred and fifty thousand dollars total and 10 days to make it <laughs> so it was like um and like with a with an unknown cast of course um and me being you know i'll say this it was the most fun directing movie experience that i ever had because i was just dying to make a movie and and everyone was having so much fun uh but well, that was really enjoyable. You, you know, you kind of think you're, you're seeing the forest through the trees, but you're really not. Um, you, and the thing is your first movie uh, to me, the big problem to jump ahead a little bit with it is that I cut the movie and I had not cut a full feature yet. Uh, so that was a detriment. I think, the editing is could be so it could be so much better. I, I wish I had the footage to recut the movie. I actually like one dark night of the soul many years ago. I actually digitized the movie and I I I cut it now knowing what I know and cut all the fat out of it. And it was a lean sixty minutes. And I was like, that would have been really good. Like if I had made if I had could have, I, I, but I was in love with everything which is first time direct first time director disease. You just mm. fall in love with everything and you think you've made this masterpiece and you don't realize that it's fucking slow. And it's like, you just really need to, you know, you know, amp it up, but you just think you're doing it. It's, again, it's, I just think heads up, heads up my, you know, my head was up my ass and you know, you just don't realize it, but it was still the most fun I ever had because it was, I was innocent. <laughs> I didn't, you know, I, I didn't know any better. You know, I had not gotten reviews or read reviews of things. I, you know, there was no outside voices. It was just me. And for better or worse, Charlie just let me go. And I wish as much as it probably would have pissed me off. I wish that he would have imposed another editor on me after I had done a cut and go, okay, now we're going to shape this. And now let me guide you on how this is going to work. Do you but think he was him, too distracted at the time? Okay. I was going to say, do you think him just letting you go and being hands off was like his, his thanking you for, no. for doing what? Okay. I think he was just too distracted. It, not that, not that, you know, Charlie was, you know, not in my corner because he was, um, but yeah, I, I think he was just too distracted and it was like, Hey, it's a movie. It's cheap. Well, it'll sell whatever it is. Well, do you, do you, what were the, the 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 because I, I remember a lot of people liking the movie back in the day. Do you remember like the reviews or the 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 feedback that you got from it? Um yeah uh well the funny thing is because uh, you know because of growing up um you know here uh, uh, and working in the business stuff you know and going to Fangoria conventions and getting to know all these people and everything uh we we got a lot 
for a full moon movie at that time, we got a lot of press. We got the cover mm-hmm. of Rue Morgue magazine. We got, you know, a, a very big spread in Fangoria. Uh, so it rose the anticipation up a lot. So when the, it got some good reviews, but the, the reviews were pretty vicious. Mm-hmm. <laughs> pretty vicious. It's like, this is not funny. They think he, he thinks he's so clever with his writing and it's not. And, sucks and why is this you know low rent rob zombie in there and, you know all these things they like the makeup they like the the two main zombies you know i tried to explain as best i could then why it's like it's not a horror zombies and why they aren't eating people it's like well i if i can't do it as good as romero i don't want to do it right yeah. right and we weren't going to be able to do it as good as romero we didn't have the time so um you know but uh yeah uh, the, the reviews were, and I, I, again, I, I, you know, I just, t- I took them to heart. I, I, I take reviews at the time. I took reviews very personally. Right. right. Um, so, it, so it, it hurt, it hurt a lot. Um, and still, I don't know if there's, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't see a lot of people talking about the movie. So <laughs> it's well, like, been, not that I go, I, but the thing is I don't go looking for it either. Right. Right. Um, right. But so I, I really don't know. Uh, I love the cover. I loved working with my friends who were, you know, in, 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 in the band that did, I, you know, I got my own theme song, which I thought was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so I enjoyed all of that. Um, I'm still friends with, you know, a lot of the people connected with that movie to this day so you know that part that part's good yeah mm. i'm i'm definitely team topaz oh yeah um but th- there, there there's been a lot of love for uh daily living in the chat my buddy dan says that his local mon pa video store could barely keep it in stock that it was such I a treat to that, the zombie drought. that box you know one of the things is that, you know it's not just that the the zombie look cool i think there 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 was a thing that i least thought i had heard at the time which was a psychological thing where if you had a box with eyes that were looking out at you it attracted you more to it that oh mm, mm. yeah one of the one of the very first my one of my earliest memories is being at the video store and finding myself standing in front of the horror section and one of the first boxes that jumped out to me was evil dead 2 right because it's looking right at me which basically so. dead hate the living is in a way that cover is the same, you know, it's sort of the same thing. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Has there ever been any talk of, uh, you said you digitized it. What about putting the dead hate the living out on Blu-ray? Well, here's the problem. Okay. So the movie was shot on 35 millimeter film. Um, but, um, they just transferred that to, uh, tapes. And I don't know if they were, I don't think they had digibeta at the time. It was some sort of beta format. Um, Mm -hmm. Not like the little tiny tapes. These are professional grade ones, but um, you know, we never cut negative. There was never a print made. Um, I would bet my bottom dollar that that negative is long gone and thrown away and destroyed. Um, I don't know what the master is on that so i don't think i i I think at best you if he had a master you might be able to up convert it but i it's not like you're gonna get a widescreen presentation or anything like that so i don't know if it's even possible Hmm. did you i mean you mentioned it ibon looks like rob zombie was yeah. that in, was that intentional? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but the funny thing is this: uh, it it wasn't. Again, it was. Uh, and you want? I'll, I'll tell you a very funny story about that in a minute. Um, um, originally, I got this. I just I had this thing in my head. You know, I wanted a rock and roll element to it, so I gave the script to D. Snyder. I met with Blackie Lawless. I, you know, I just had the, you know, um, um, and then I was talking to Tom Savini about doing it. And at that time he was going to do vampires or something. So he already had like the long hair and stuff like that. So he was kind of looking and then I couldn't get any of them. 
but I just fixated on this image and it just turned out that way. Mm. Um, and I remember <laughs> there was a place, uh, it wasn't my place. I didn't own it. Uh, Jamie, I'm sure knows this. And, and I know we're all from J do. There was a place in studio city, which is in the Valley called Dave's laser, which was a amazing laser disc store and then went to DVD. And you would see everyone shopping there. I mean, you'd walk in and there would be Will Smith or you'd walk in and John Woo's there. And it was just like, again, a family thing where you knew all the people who worked at the counter and were talking to him and everything else. Rob Zombie was in there one day. So I ran to my car and grabbed a VHS and gave it to him <laughs> and then fled. It was like, you're just a really big inspiration. Thank you. Um, and this is before, but, uh, and I think he had shot house of a thousand corpses, but it hadn't come out yet. Uh, and the funny thing is tiny in that movie was the zombie gaunt in my movie. Mm -hmm. So there was that connection too, but um, I never asked uh, Matt McGorry if he ever talked to Rob about the movie. <laughs> I, you know what? I, I, I think Rob owes you a debt. <laughs> well, I don't know if I, I really have no idea if that's how he knew about Matt. I have a feeling he, he, he found about Matt because Matt was on Howard Stern. Well, that's true too. He was on Howard Stern. So I do want to share with you a photo that Todd shared on Twitter. Oh no. This is a photo he took of you. He was <laughs> Of course. Uh, here's a pick of here's a pick of me and Dave peeing together. Yeah. So that's I'm, that's that's bonding right there. Well, he looks so disturbed. That that's bonding right there. Yeah. You know. Thanks, Todd. <laughs> he could share. Worse. He this, could probably this, share worse. Listen, it, it meant that much to Todd that he took a picture of it. Oh my god. So <laughs> I'll have to put that in the. This thumbnail. is why I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> well todd, todd you may need to go to uh, instagram oh god to to haunt uh, dave over there then yeah but um uh yeah it looks like we've got a lot of memories of dave's laser in the uh, chat mm -hmm. jamie says he spent thousands of dollars there over the years yeah <laughs> yeah we we so. i think everyone did it was it was the place it was the place it was great well, shortly after the dead hate the living, uh, you got to the opportunity to work with one of the most uh, renowned, celebrated, brilliant filmmakers of our time or any other. Uh, I'm talking about Uwe Boll. Um, tell us about how House of the Dead came along. All right. So uh, after, after I'd finished Dead Hate the Living, but before it had come out, uh, there was a group of group of friends that uh, consisted of a lot of people behind the movie Free Enterprise, which is a Star Trek swingers type comedy that stars William Shatner. And my friend Robert Burnett and Mark Altman made that movie. They wrote it together. Mark produced it. Rob directed it. Um, and we would get together and we would share new, um, we would share our work, you know, someone, you know, uh, one of our friends did, uh, a short, I don't know if he shared it then, but I think he did called troops, which was one of the first sort of star Wars fan films. It was a takeoff on cops. It's pretty famous, but with stormtroopers. So we would get together on these things and, and we would show our stuff and, uh, one time it was dead hate the living and uh, another guy's uh, I think it was Mike, Mike Hurst or his brother. It was a crime movie anyway. Mm -hmm. um, Mark was there and he really liked it. And so he mentioned then he's like, I think we're getting the rights to house of the dead. Would you be interested in doing it? And I was like, uh, yeah, yeah, I would. I really would. Um, so that began the process. I went over there and I met with um, Mark 
and Dan Bates, who were the producers at Mindfire Entertainment. Um, and I sat down, and this was the this was the first meeting. They go, well, we don't want to adapt the game. I'm like, okay, yeah, you know, they're making the Resident Evil movie, so you know the stories are kind of, you know, you know, they didn't know they just based on the game. They had no idea what they were doing in the Resident Evil movie. I go, but you know, it's it's just too kind of close, so we don't want to do that, you know. Um, I'm like, oh, and, you know, we need you know, like younger characters, and you know, and. Then they go, we want a rave. How about a rave? That'd be cool. I'm like, okay. And, you know, you know, what if we set it on an island? You know, wouldn't it be awesome if we were shooting like, like someplace tropical or, you know, and everything? Wouldn't that be like, that would be so much fun. I'm like, okay. Now, but it's, the just, thing it's, is, it's one red flag after another. Yeah. But I am not in a position to turn down this opportunity. Right. So, um, under uh, a lot of duress, I I go and work and write the first draft. Now my approach is now I I, I you know I had to use the thing. I had to like okay, uh, they're going to this rave on this this secluded island, um, and then there are zombies and you know all this stuff that happens there. So honestly, the structure of the movie is kind of the skeleton that I had. But uh, the rave was more of a wicker man kind of deal. Mm. I wanted it again. I just wanted it to, you know, be one of these, you know, really kind of iconic, cool things. Um, and definitely had a boat captain and, you know, police enforcement and stuff, you know, to get in there. But um, I wrote the first draft and then I. Um, I didn't hear anything back. I didn't get any notes. And then two weeks later, Mark sends me his rewrite of the script, which is, Oh, the other thing was I treated the zombies completely serious. There was no, there was no movie jokes. There was no in jokes. I told them I don't want to do anything like dead, hate the living. As far as I don't want to make a reference to a movie, nothing. And it was, filled with references to zombie yeah. movies and Romero and all this stuff that's in the movie. And I walked in there and I said, I, I said, guys, I don't think I'm the person to do this. I go, this is completely not what we discussed. <laughs> you know, this is, this is, this is, it's, it's not, it's not, good it's it's too comedic and stuff and there's well you can you know pull it back and stuff so i went and did another draft of it pointlessly because at the end of the day they use that dra they use that draft that mark altman wrote and then you know it comes down to it he puts my name first uh, whether it was to throw blame at me or oh i'm being such a nice guy um they paid me i did it i don't get any points on it or anything like that so um, I never met Uwe Boll until they screened the movie for the first time at the American film market. And I, so I, I didn't know who, I didn't know who he was. I knew they talked about me directing it. Uh, that didn't happen because Uwe came with the money. He brought money. So he got to direct it. Um, I never, I never went to set. I never saw any dailies. I never saw anything. It was just this, black void for two years or so before it came out um and uh it, yeah and then then the movie was the movie and i i, I hate it i absolutely i i, I do uh well, there's really not anything about it that i like <laughs> what was your what was and your... i certainly didn't put please Put eight bit video game footage in the movie. <laughs> oh God! I well, I remember when the movie was first coming out. Uwe Boll was very. The rumor was that they'd put video game footage in the movie, and Uwe Boll would not confirm or deny that that happened. So he right. put the footage in the movie, but then he kind of also knew that that was almost a, like a, a faux pas or something. But he wanted it in the movie. Yeah, it was. Uh, 
wow. Yeah, it was, I mean, and, and you know, I was like, so I went to see the movie. I was like, okay, okay well, so you, you start at well, the end well, of the movie. Let, well, let me, <laughs> let, let, let me set things up too. Cause okay. people may, people, people may not know about this. House of the Dead was a big theatrical release. It, oh yeah, it was. And, um, like full, I remember big, you know, I want trailers open, for the, yeah. I want opening night in Burbank to a sold out show. Well, what t- take us to that first time you saw the film. So the first see, time before you see, it, you, you see your name, uh, before on open, but, but, yeah, but before it opened in theaters, there was the American film market, which was for buyers mm-hmm. and they screened it there. And I watched it and it was like, okay, why you're starting at the end of the movie now i okay i don't get this and then the, you know and, you know then it's like okay they're on a boat that's fine and then they get to the rave which is during the day and there's a sega sign and i'm like yeah oh god and that's it there's like a tent and a, a sega sign on a, on a stage and, and it's during the day and i'm like oh god what is this and then it just progressively just kept going downhill from there and and then then the not you know then seeing the video game footage in it as like transitions was just like wow okay uh that's a head scratcher um yeah so that was my experience with that i got i i was kind of shell-shocked after seeing it the first time i just kind of had to like go for a while <laughs> <laughs> well you you said you you what was you didn't get to meet uve until later what was that meeting like oh it was right after that screening so i'm <laughs> shell-shocked i meet him in the lobby and goes so what do you think i go well it's a movie i, I, <laughs> I, I, I had nothing to say because i was gonna go <clears throat> what the fuck are you what, what did you do it's like what what is this um and then of course later uh of course, he blamed the screenwriters later. Of course, of course. Why the movie sucks so bad. But, right. I, you know, time has proven that it's not just a shitty script, which the script was shitty. <laughs> you know, but it just wasn't mine. So it's like, why is my name first? <laughs> it's like, stop. Because um, I know everyone who watched that thing, who would watch Dead Hate the Living, probably thought all those fucking in jokes were mine. I, when I first saw the film, yes, because because I, I I remembered you from Dead Hate the Living, and I was like, right. well, you know, this guy knows his stuff, so clearly he's bringing in his love of Romero yeah, into no. this and talking a lot about Romero and the Dead trilogy and yada yada yada. Yeah, no, 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 no. I I, I like I made a very big point, and uh, a couple people I know. I knew Rolf at the time and Jay and everything. They can attest to that, that I was like, no, I am not putting, I, I learned my lesson because what I learned from dead hate living is stop reminding people of better movies mm. with your movie. <laughs> you know, don't, don't remind them of better movies when you're doing, you know, when they're watching yours because, and you know, if you're making references to zombie or gates of hell, I mean, all these things were had higher production value and everything than dead Hate the living. And so it was like, um, and this is the same thing with house of the dead. It was like, don't remind people, of, you know, Romero movies and stuff. Just be your own, be your own thing. Right. You know, or evil dead, like Uwe Bull has, you know, you know, a, 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 a iota of talent, like of Sam Raimi. He, he wishes. Yeah. So, yeah. I do want to mention really quick that um, I pinned uh, Jay's website in the oh, chat nice. where all the information about uh, Puppet Wars is for anybody who's uh, who wants to uh, find out more about Puppet Wars. Jay also mentions that he was at that screening and Uwe basically announced that this is a masterpiece. Oh, I blocked that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I blocked that out. Do yeah. you, uh, my buddy Tim, wants, do you still have your original draft of House of the no, Dead? I don't. I don't okay. think so. I, I don't I don't think so. I think I just kind of buried everything. <laughs> I just it was just like it was just like ah you know at a certain point you just got to move on. I didn't want to yeah. hold on to that. Is it is it still? Or, uh, I I'm going to assume that it it was a painful thing to talk about for a long time. Is yeah. it still painful to talk about in any way? No, 
No. Okay. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, look, you got to eventually you got to like start getting a little bit of a tough skin. So right. it's like, you know, that that experience, I'm sure, added some layers. Yeah, that one did because that but it, but initially it did. It did affect me again. I was like, I don't want to write. I don't want to do anything. And I kind of just went. I moved away from trying to write stuff and make stuff, you know, direct stuff for a while. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, do you, I've spoken to, to, to filmmakers who've been part of blunders or just movies that underperformed at the box office and how that can have such a psychological it, it, damage. I, I was going to say, yeah, an, an impact psychologically and an impact on, on your career. And but it's dumb. It's dumb to do that. Uh, you know, looking back, I should have, you know, just pulled up my, you know, big boy pants and, and kept writing at least. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, I, yeah, I should have for sure. Any other, like every writer has got to have like that one nightmare story where, you know, the, all they kept was my title. <laughs> they changed everything else and gave me credit and the movie was awful. Any other experiences like that? Luckily not. <laughs> I don't think so. No, no. My luckily, favorite. one That one's enough <laughs> for now. <laughs> My favorite writer horror story is, um, oh gosh, well, I forget his name. He wrote the movie. They Wes Craven's they. Okay. Maybe it's maybe uh, Brendan hood might be his name. But he uh, he got an agent the old fashioned way. He wrote a query letter and he landed an agent. The agent sold his script to the Weinstein's, and it was immediately uh, rewrote. Yep, a, a dozen times. And at the end of the day, all that remained was his title, and he got sole screenwriter credit. I don't even get how that works. And he uh, he said I was caught in a catch twenty two where I needed the credit to continue working. Yeah. But on the other hand, the credit makes me look like the worst writer who's ever lived. Right. So, um, hmm. but at least that one wasn't as infamously horrible as House of the Dead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people weren't talking about, they were going, yeah, they, yeah, it's not so good. But, you know, they weren't going, oh my God. Mm. Oh, wow. Jamie, Jamie Blanks actually says he was set to direct they. Oh, wow. But uh, backed away. That was wise, very wise of you. Oh, Robert Harmon. How Robert Harmon did direct it. Yeah, it, wow. it's a good, you know, it's a good looking movie, but it makes I do no remember sense. that. Yeah. It makes no sense whatsoever. And I think Todd's had a few of those writer horror stories, he says. Yeah, just so. a couple. But Todd writes more. So he would have more, he would have more um experiences like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually, some you know, the the few that I do know are pretty crushing in a way, because they were very cool projects. And Todd's a really good writer. It's true. I'm not just saying that because he shared that photo. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want him to share others. You don't know what, what else he's got. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know you've, you've done quite a lot of editing. Um, yeah. Do you think being an editor has made you a better filmmaker now that you kind of see the nuts and bolts of like coverage and this can fit into that and that absolutely this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think, I think uh, being an editor, especially when I'm working, especially when you're working with either a tight schedule or low budget, uh, which is all I've been really doing, uh, you can, you know, you can look at the script and you can really like almost edit before you shoot. So you can be really efficient and you, you know, and after a while, when you do it enough, you, you do, you do get timing and you do, you know, you know, timing better and, and, you know, the rhythm of the piece. Well, so I think, it, you know, I think every director should learn how to edit. I think it's invaluable. I think it, it, you know, it makes you, whether you end up editing all your stuff or not having that knowledge, I think really makes you a, a much stronger director. In 2009, the hills were alive with the sounds of murder. How did uh, the hills run red come about? Okay, so um, so between Ten Eight the Living and Hills, uh, I really went into editing, and what I really ended up specializing in was uh, 
DVD special features. These these and the and these were like long form documentaries about movies. A lot of retrospective stuff, you know, uh, and and current stuff. And what they were they were for. I just want to bring this up because it, it's the natural progression. Um, and they were for like movies like you know, the X-Men films and Spider-Man two. And, uh, you know, I worked on, you know, a lot of uh, big projects. And then I spent, you know, six months in New Zealand working on the first Chronicles of Narnia documenting that movie and seeing this giant movie get put together. Um, so in a way I looked at it as sort of like going, I'm going back to school to learn how to direct, but my professors now are, Sam Raimi, Ridley Scott, you know, Andrew Adamson, and, you know, and, um, yeah, so I did that. And when, while we were finishing up, we did Superman Returns. We did this three and a half hour documentary about Superman Returns. Brian Singer wanted it to be his Lord of the Rings, you know, mm -hmm. opus as far as the making of stuff. So we were working on that <clears throat> and, um, I was starting to hear from other other directors in town um, that they were bringing up my name because there was this group called Media Blasters or Shriek Show mm. out of New York who had done two low budget movies. I think one was called Flesh for the Beast and the other one was Shadow Dead Riot that they shot on the East Coast. And they were coming out here to the West Coast to meet some West Coast talent because they had a couple projects and they wanted to try to like, whether it was up the game or just, you know, come out here and see. And um, so they had two projects. One was Wicked Lake and one was The Hills Run Red. They had these two scripts. And uh, a lot of the directors that they were talking to were friends of mine uh, were turning them down <laughs> and like, yeah, I don't really like this, but you should call Dave. He'd do anything <laughs> right now. <laughs> uh, several people like recommended me. I was like, yeah, Dave's desperate enough. He'll do anything. Um, so they reached out to us. Uh, and, oh, and I should say that Daniel Schweiger also recommended me, who was the guy that I worked for initially at Full Moon. He was friends with one of the guys. Um, so we got the scripts. Um, and I was working for Robert Burnett at the time doing these, uh, special features. And, uh, so we got both scripts and I took to Hills because it was sort of a slasher kind of movie. Um, and he liked Wicked Lake better because it was more of like a last house on the left with witches kind of thing. He was mm -hmm. like, that's more my speed. I'm like, okay, cool. So then I went to the process of uh, doing script notes on the script, which uh, was fine. So I came up with a bunch of notes. And then I had uh, an artist friend of mine named Michael Broom, who is now a conceptual artist for KMB effects, um, do designs for Babyface and scene uh, ideas for scenes that I had that I would like to put into the script. Um. And so when they came out, we met them, uh, you know, I had all this stuff printed out and I did this whole presentation and they went away and they, they liked it. Um, and, you know, we said, well, we want to do a rewrite of the script and they were okay with that. And I think and we sweetened the deal because we had um, asked our friend David Scow uh, to do it. And he agreed to do it uh, for People who don't know, David Scow wrote The Crow. He wrote Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. He wrote a couple of the Critters movies. He wrote he wrote the original draft of Chainsaw the Beginning. You know, another one of those where it's like, this isn't my story at all. <laughs> but I, I <laughs> story credit. Um, and he's been a friend for a, a really long time. So uh, it just worked out timing-wise. He could fit this in. And it really became a page one rewrite. Um, how, how was it working with David Scow? Awesome. I mean, Dave's been a friend of mine for, uh, since I met him in 89. So he's been a friend ever since. Um, and it was great. Uh, you know, we would sit in his office, you know, it would be two, three in the morning. We would be talking ideas out and stuff and then he would go, right. 
So, um, but at the same time, we're going through this. Um, the guys at Media Blasters, uh, they go, "Oh, well, we want we want to do a um, sort of a, a proof of concept sort of teaser shoot to like announce the movie," which really was them going we don't know if this yahoo can fucking direct so D testing you yeah so uh we put together this uh shoot on hollywood boulevard in an old kind of theater that had turned into sort of like a grindhouse theater um and we did this thing it's it's on the it's on the blu-ray mm -hmm. and um and we do that and we we you know um put that together and um it got, but it got really weird with these guys. Um, at the same time, this this process was dragging on over the course of a year uh, with them, with the script and going back and forth with the notes on the script and 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 just them pulling the trigger. Um, and you know, when you shoot something here in Los Angeles, you have to get production insurance. So some of the money was spent to get uh, and and we were under the assumption that we would do this and the movie was going to be $250,000 at most the whole movie it was going to be a very low budget movie that they were funding and um so we we expected very shortly within within that time of year that we were going to be rolling into the movie so we bought production insurance for the entire year not just for the one day which was not significantly more money but one and they were there on set um one they they accused us uh they accused rob more specifically of um stealing the money and pocketing it which they were on they were on set we were on hollywood boulevard with a generator and a crew and you know all, it was like give me a give me a yeah. break yeah you could see it but they just didn't know so they they accused him of that um and then they wanted to premiere the teaser trailer at a fangoria convention out here and i was working at the time and um so i said okay that's fine i will i said great where do you guys want me to drop it off there? It's like, well, here's this guy, give it to him, let him know it's for us. So I, I go down to the convention center and I drop it off to the right guy with all the instructions. And he's like, cool, great. I get a call later and it's one of the producers who's going, you motherfucker, you, you didn't even shoot this thing. There's no trailer here. There's nothing. It was, it was unbelievable. I left work. I drove down. I went to the convention. I walked up. I walked to the person that I left it with. I said, where is it? He goes, it's right here. I grab it. I shove it in the producer's hands. Go, don't ever say that I fucking lied. It's like, here's your goddamn trailer, which they couldn't get shown at the convention. Tony was like, fuck you. I, who are you? I got it shown because I know Tony and I've known him for years. Also during that time, we're working on Superman Returns for Warner Brothers. And Rob was talking to Brian Singer, who came to the set when we were shooting this teaser, was well aware of what we were doing. And he was talking to him and Brian was like, this is ridiculous. This, you have the writer of The Crow, you have the title of The Hills Run Red, this should be a Warner Brothers movie. And we both, I wasn't there, but Rob laughed and said, yeah, we'll just walk in. And uh, to his credit, Brian made a call to Diane Nelson, who at the time was head of Warner Premier, and said, I want you to meet with these guys. And she was like, okay. Um, so we walk in with the teaser trailer, David Scow's script, make the presentation, and I leave going, there's no fucking way they're going to make this movie. It's, it's too nasty. I mean, this is Warner brothers. Again, this is ridiculous. I don't even right, know. Right. Came. Two weeks later, we get a call from Diane Nelson going, yeah, we really like this. And we have a deal with dark castle and Joe silver that we're going to be doing these um, direct to video 
movie premieres. We've just done Return to House on Haunted Hill, so we want The Hills Run Red to be the next one. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, what? 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 This is insane. And then that began a year process of meeting with them and waiting for the green light. And it took a year from the time that we had gotten that news that it was going to be a Warner premiere thing and they were buying out media blasters. So I never had to see or talk to those guys ever again, mm -hmm. who also uh, they wanted to have a meeting with me the day after the Fangoria convention. So we have breakfast and they knew Rob had told them a little bit about the Warner brothers interest. So they knew about it and they go, well, you have to fire Robert. And are you, you're crazy. Warner brothers is never going to make this movie. And if they do, they're never going to let you direct it because you're nobody. These were my producers wow. saying this. These are some, these are some lovable guys. Yeah. And I was just like, what? I, I don't know what I did except bust my ass to, you know, to offend them. But yeah, uh, I, or, you know, I, but I was just like, well, I said, we'll cross that bridge, you know, when we get there, but you know, you want to fire Robert, you fire him. I'm not doing it. It's like, it's not my job. Um, but then, yeah, we got rid of them. And then, yeah, it was just a, it was a year waiting. And, and during that year going, this movie is never going to happen. Is it a, yeah. It's did never you ever gonna happen? Did you ever meet with Joe Silver? I only met I met Joe Silver twice, and it was after the movie, mm. <laughs> which was probably good for the for the best. It was probably for the best. Um, I had I did have I had great people there. I like his his second hand man, uh, Steve Richards, who was really great. Um, we had um, uh, Eric Olson was our our main producer from from silver and he was really great. And Ethan Irwin and uh, Sean Finnegan were, were kind of the, the main group like involved with it. And then there was, then there's, um, then there's a line producers when we, we, when a year later we finally get the call. It's like, okay, you're going next month. Uh, we're going to shoot it in Bulgaria. <laughs> it was just that quick. It's like, and you're leaving in a month. It was like all that waiting. But, and then yeah, it's like, shit. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, and then that process happened. Then, well, then there was that. Bulgaria seems to be a hot spot for American productions. We were talking about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre at the beginning of the stream, and it was shot in Bulgaria. That's what were, the one they've shot in Bulgaria too, because the, oh, the, the Leatherface, Leatherface was one was shot right. there too. Um, yeah. It's cheap. You get a yeah a lot, uh, and it's cheap. And the the crews are crews are fantastic. They're really really good. Um, very dedicated, um, and and it's and it's really it, you get so much more for the dollar. Um, and you know, surprisingly, with like what we were shooting and everything, it, it, it you know you can't really tell. Mm -hmm. It's it, like if we were doing a movie that was, it looked shot like it was in the city. It looked know. like it was like a, the Pacific Northwest or something for me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, which was which is cool. I you know I, I assume they built the town for for chainsaw. I don't know where, you know where oh, yeah. that was, but uh, yeah, but they yeah, uh, it was a uh, it was it was interesting. Uh, but but yeah, the people were the people, the crews and the people there were fantastic. Yeah, you you're directing a film in Bulgaria, produced by Joel Silver for Warner Brothers. I, I, I assume you've got a fairly decent budget. You've got it a good jumped, cast. It, it jumped. What they say in the books, it jumped from a two hundred fifty thousand dollar movie to a four million dollar movie, but I th or maybe it was two million. I think it was more. I think it was more like two, and, and and then you, and then you, take Joel Silver's fee off the top, and you know, that's significant. And, you know, so it's like, um, and then there, and then it's Bulgaria. So you know, it's like everyone's everyone's skimming off the top of these things you know right, 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 so yeah. it's like i have no idea exactly how much the movie really was made for i oh. think they claim for but there's no way it was four million bucks <laughs> but you you're you're in bulgaria you you've a warner brothers movie you have mm -hmm. decent budget you got yeah. a good cast william Sa i love william sadler yeah that Any... was that was uh, awesome that was i always wanted him i didn't want the standard i well one 
I didn't want Jeffrey Combs because he's tied to House on Haunted Hill. Right, right, right. I didn't want any of the horror guys. I just, I, but I always thought Sadler would be. I, I just love William Sadler. I think he's such a great actor, and I, you know, I love Walter Hill movies, and he's been in so many of them. So I was like, nah, I think if we could get him, and I know, I know, Joel would be happy because he's used Sadler a lot. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, he, you know, and he would be able to get to him easy. <laughs> so uh yeah any butterflies flying around the uh the days or weeks leading up to that oh sure i was yeah i was nervous as hell <laughs> <I> was like, <laughs> how, how did you deal with that nervousness did you just uh, prepare yeah, the, as much the, as the very first thing he had to do was a sex scene that was cut out of the movie so uh yeah i got to know bill pretty intimately right 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 wow. off the bat <laughs> so it was like um yeah <laughs> <laughs> so that that broke the ice pretty quick um, that would, and that the would. thing is that what you know he was only there for a week he was there he was there very quickly um so you know you just kind of had to like at the, at a certain point you just have to you know dive in and just do it you know yeah there's no you know there's no time for butterflies it's the, it, at most it's like well here's what I need you to do here. And it's like, well, you're going to be having sex with this woman who doesn't speak. English. <laughs> and then you're going to bash her brains out with a baseball bat while you're in bed together. Cool. Okay. Great. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's, that's, that's day right. one. That's yeah, day one. <laughs> that's day one with, with Bill Sadler. He had, a, he, but he had a great sense of humor about everything. And, and, you know, he, he was incredibly, incredibly nice and giving and, and, and patient with me. <laughs> one of the, one of the criticisms or concerns I remember hearing people say when the movie was first coming out was um, some of the casting. Now I understand that Warner brothers basically said you're, these two are in the movie period. You had no right. control over Sophie. Yes, the two, the two and, leads, Sophie and Tad. Yeah, they they chose them for me. I mean, I looked at a lot of people. Um, funny enough, uh, I remember the guy who stars in Reacher now, Alan Alan uh, Alan Richardson or whatever, mm -hmm. who's in that show Reacher. He auditioned, and I was like, "Well, this guy's huge. I he'll 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 beat up the killer in two seconds. <laughs> I can't I can't have you know super super nice guy. But yeah, um, yeah, they just I, and they just. It's like this is who we want to go with, and I was like, I didn't know who Sophie Monk was, and I I watched. Uh, the only thing I could see was an episode of Entourage. I'm like, well, okay. Um, and Tad, I hadn't, I hadn't seen anything that Tad had done at the time. I was like, you just got to be like, okay. Well, I hope they can act. Yeah, I hope I hope they're I hope they're ready for uh you know, I hope they're ready for it. And, and I think they both did great jobs in the movie they did too, but they, they, they worked the, the thing is they worked really hard so i really i really appreciate that they didn't um but again you know the you know the thing is with tad and and part of that's probably on me and you know he should you know that character should probably be more like me and he was so almost cw'd out Looking. very clear very clean cut. very clean cut and he should have been grunged up more um, his his friend yeah in the movie alex, alex windham yeah well you know what we, it was funny because tad and alex what we realized when we were there finally shooting is that we should have swapped them we should have swapped their roles mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um there was no way that was ever going to happen they wouldn't let me do that but that would have made more sense for the movie you know um, I, I just want to mention this really quick. Rolf mentions in the chat, he had six films he wrote that shot in Bulgaria in 2020, not horror six. Yes. Rolf wow. is a writing machine. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Todd love loves the Hills run red, by the way. Todd's a good guy. So <laughs> and, and, and Jamie's, <laughs> Thanks, a, Jamie's, God. Jamie's a big fan of it also. Oh, nice. Thanks, so, man. Yeah. Um, she was uh I, I knew I know Sophie was a she was a big singer in uh Australia. Um mm -hmm. she was part of this band called Bardo, I believe. Um but again, I didn't know her at all. But I get to say this, she 
came in and she was game for anything and she really worked really hard we had and and that was the thing i had a really great uh working experience with all of them Mm -hmm. with 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 the four and janet montgomery is you know the other Mm -hmm. female lead and you know she's great and she's certainly gone off to do you know she's on a show called new amsterdam now i mean she's done a lot of 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 stuff so yeah. Um, yeah. Um, they you were had, all really great to work with. You it had a great later, character. It was, it was just later on that Sophie kind of like turned her back on. <laughs> yeah. Didn't she, hasn't she kind of, she shot, uh, she took a total shit on the movie like last year or the year before for reasons. I have no idea. Uh, she, is it, is it... she claims that she was supposed to be in, um, the hangover mm-hmm. and she turned it down to do this part. That wasn't true. <laughs> Um, you know, but it's so weird. And she said, and she is like, oh, and then we're doing, you know, we're in Bulgaria and these weird people. And it was like, she, uh, the, she's just rewriting history for mm-hmm. what gain. I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe she's upset because she did a really good job in the movie and it didn't really yeah. lead to anything. I don't know. I do not know. Um, but she was lovely to everyone. She had a great attitude. There was never a problem with her. And, you know, it's, I, but why? I have no idea. I mean, look, she's naked a lot in it. I get it. You know, people change their mind on things. And yeah, I get it. You know, it's, she, you know, she sure I, seemed I mean, to be having a good time and loving the character in the interviews that she did for the, the well, film. Again, she did. And we all like, hung out together quite a bit it wasn't like she wasn't above she was just i think she, the funny thing is i think she because when she was in australia and she would date some very high profile people you know she was constantly in the in the spotlight and everything and i think she liked bulgaria because she could just sort of relax for a little bit right, right. chill out so but again i don't know i i don't want to I, I can't understand why because i thought she did a really she did really good job in the movie she had a really meaty role in that movie and she yeah. did an excellent job i thought yeah i mean i think i i will say i think it to me at least it's the 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 most well-rounded best role that she's gotten to play yeah. so but i don't know you'd have to ask her mm. you wanted to create a new a new slasher icon in the form of Babyface, um and e- even though Babyface didn't quite cross over into like you know like say a ghost face or a jason or whatever there there's a lot of love for Babyface online that i've noticed um but why do you think we've not had like a a major new slasher or horror icon in in really since Ghostface, to be honest, I mean, I, I, the, the, I mean, and again, he's not a slasher, but I, I, w- I was talking about this the the other the, uh, last night. Um, I, who else? Jigsaw would be the only sort of horror character, I guess, that is yeah. sort of crossed, you know, broken through. Because there's, but again, we're not we weren't getting so many uh, like character horror based movies that weren't, you know, another sequel or something. And it, you, there's not, you can't pinpoint insidious or the conjuring to a specific, you know, uh, reoccurring, you know, demon. It's, it's the Warrens. It's, you know, right. it's Lin Shay. Um, I mean, I think, I think part of it is that people have certainly tried, but it might maybe, you know, I mean, and there's been like Hellfest was, a was, a, I mean, I guess the strangers would be the other one. Along with Ghostface, mm-hmm. I get the stranger seems to be very popular with people, at least the image of, of those three characters. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think that, you know, I think the audience, I think the fans and everything, they, 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 they just kind of like the old, the old guard, the, you know, the, the old guys. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's hard. I mean, now I'm seeing like even Jamie's movie, Valentine. Now it's like, I mean, has that been like 20 years, that movie around mm-hmm. there? You know, now there's like Valentine masks and that's sort of started to come around um, a, a little, a, a lot more than what, you know, I think when it came out. Um, 
but um yeah i don't know i i don't um I, oh well of course the big one is terrifier right art the clown is the is is the the, the newest slasher that has like whether i don't know how how this little movie like did it it's the, whether it's just the image of the clown or something but that 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 thing is all over the place now i had i had no idea how big art the clown was until i went to a convention in new jersey uh mm -hmm. last year they had like the entire terrifier cast there including the guy who plays art and where they were in the cent in the convention center, they were constantly swamped. Yeah, that's crazy. And it was mostly women. Like, right. like the guys were on the floor talking to, you know what I mean? The the the, the old school horror gang. Right. You know right. what I mean? And the women were talking to Art the Clown and the the people behind Terrifier, but they were always <laughs> swamped. Every time I saw them, they had a huge line. And I was like, holy crap. I, I, I knew that Terrifier and Art the Clown had fans, but I didn't realize how many and, the, and how many they seem to fans. all be female fans. That's really interesting. I I I, I don't know about that. I, you know, I I know so little about why what it why it works except that it, it, there's something about that image i guess uh, of that character that's it must, just I, I can't put my finger on it either it's 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 a clown with really bad teeth yeah i guess women are down with for that i don't know but yeah i you know but again it's also the the nice thing is too that that character's had really consistent visibility in products and things since that movie came out right it's almost like oh you can totally like just just see the imagery and not even know what the movie is and it will probably still work for people um and then i guess people like clowns I, you know, it's weird um but they but again they've certainly tried like haunt tried the movie haunt, haunt. Mm -hmm. um todd farmer brought yeah, yeah, trick. It, trick was another one. Hellfest mm -hmm. was another one. Hellfest was great. You know, oh, I loved Hellfest. But again, I don't think the the look of the killer was all that iconic. No. Um, to me, it's like you know, if you're gonna create one of these things, you know, really do your best to to make it stand out. Which is, I mean, with Hills, that we spent you know a long time. I worked yeah working with Mike Broom and people for but during that whole year when we weren't making the movie where we're waiting for it to be made um we really 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 worked on it and then i was you know and it was like oh what's he gonna wear and i was the one who came up with the the red hunting coat because i was like that's different i mean most of these guys are trying to be in the dark and now it's like i want him to stand out and it made sense for the character you know all these things about it and when i really started thinking about it, it's funny you know i started thinking about even with the mask the psychological aspects of the character with it it's like well because this character is volunteering to be this he doesn't want to ever take this mask off which is why he cuts his face off and he sews the thing on it's like no he wants to be this and so it's you know that and then all the scars and scratches i'm like the the jaw replaced, you know, it's like, well, yeah, because people have fought back. Right. You know, so the mask has gotten damaged. So yeah, it all came into that. And I, look, I'm very grateful that, you know, people still like the character and the imagery. Um, I, you know, I wish I could get someone at Warner brothers uh, marketing to at least get back to me. So I could let, you know, other companies like trick or treat studios has asked me like, to you know at least point them to a place if they want to license the rights i don't know yeah i don't know what i don't know what what, what the uh the resistance is there for them to make money unless it's to them they just have forgotten that the movie exists yeah <laughs> which i think is probably more more to the point well you you mentioned the the mask and and, and i love the baby face mask especially like you said that the broken like piece together one but the 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 mask in the original script was a literal baby's face. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And that to me was just like, no, I don't want to go there. 
that's way yeah. too, I, you know, fine. Maybe I'm a, maybe I'm a pussy and they were all about wanting to be extreme horror, but I didn't want to do that one. It's like, okay. So then, then, then he is just a, a, a leather face wannabe. It's right. like, uh, least mine can be sort of a hybrid between Jason and Leatherface, you know? So it was like, okay, that's a little better. And, you know, I just think, I think is scary and looks cooler. I mean, I'm sure. Yeah. It's just the, the, the concept is just kind of too, kind of too gross to me. There's some, there's some, uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm a wint there. There's some lines I'm not willing to cross and, you know, Suggesting that he, you know, skinned a baby and stretched its face over his is like, yeah. <laughs> that seems like the kind of idea you, you know, like if you're trying to be a real uh, edge lord in the middle school cafeteria, you're like, <laughs> my killer would cut off a ba- a literal baby's face and wear it. You know, right? I mean, well, yeah. There was a time where there were these writers, uh, yeah, and some that I like, like Ed Lee and Brian Keene and stuff, and they would they would write this stuff that was all small press that was like uh trying to write the grossest stuff that they could possibly write to outgross each other yeah. uh, and it's just like just like the the most foul depraved you know and i was just like okay i'll i'll, I'll wait for your, i'll wait for your other books <laughs> they're, they're depraved enough for me well i, well, I mean speaking <clears throat> of of depravity when i understand the execs at warner brothers in the beginning told you to take it as far as you wanted to go this was going to be an unrated release so yeah let the blood flow let the gore mm-hmm. yeah go, i mean, i remember i was in bulgaria and we were getting we were very close to shooting and i was talking to one of the executives uh from warner premiere um i won't mention his name to protect him uh i don't want to throw him under the bus because it's old news now but i literally said these i said how far do you want me to go? And he goes, push it as far as you can. I go, okay, you remember you said this because I'm not going to dip my toe in the water. I'm going to dive in, which I said on the Blu-ray, but, but so I did, we went for it and it was, a you know, Dave Scow can write some pretty depraved shit. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there was stuff in there that we changed. I was like, nope, not doing that either. Nope. Nope. <laughs> Um, and it was a much different, you know, it was a much different time. And really the whole thing was we were, we were really just trying to make an old school, uh, pulp horror movie, you know, that was a little slicker, but it was nasty. Um, there would be so many things in it now that would be probably frowned upon. You would never probably, you probably wouldn't get it made with some of the, with the subject matter. But see, but see, here, here's the thing though. <clears throat> when they did see what you had done, they went, Whoa, we can't release that. But it was like, it, we didn't know they said, we didn't know you were going to go that far, but, but <laughs> wouldn't they have known how far you were going if they'd only read the script that they greenlit? Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think Diane Nelson actually read the script. She just she liked it. I think, I think she greenlit the movie, uh, based on the recommendation of, uh, people who are working for her and I don't think she ever read the script. Okay. That's my theory. That would have given them an idea of what they were. Yeah. Because it was all there in the script. (laughs) So it was all there. So, but see, see what, what's, what's funny though, is that what they, what you had to cut out, it wasn't, some of it is, is plot stuff. Like there's, there's the, there's the mid credit sequence where you go, well, how did, how did she get, is this, is this the friend's baby that she's carrying? Right. Or, right. You know why? And why is Sophie all about it? Cause I mean, but if, if you hadn't had to cut that, you would have known that that's baby faces, baby she's carrying. It, it, exactly. So yeah, now that it's, it's kind of implied and probably a little confusing and they were just like, well, you know, whoever's baby it is, you know, Sophie's going to raise it to be another killer. It was their reasoning it's like you don't need to know that serena was you get the implication that you know she was but yeah i mean okay you know again yeah but you know that's the thing too you know i'm not gasper no it's not irreversible rape scenes are kind of a bummer it's not real. it certainly wasn't fun to do and it wasn't it wasn't super it you know it was you know 
I mean, obviously it was exploiting, but it wasn't, it wasn't super. I mean, she was still clothed and it was more from, you were seeing it really more from her um, face, her point right. of view. Right. Um, is, is that, is that why you didn't put the, the unedited uh, no, version on the Blu-ray? No, the, see, the thing is the unedited version was never finished. So it exists in a rough cut in a, a rough cut form, never, another never color timed or anything uh wow. or mixed so the, you know no one was going to spend the money to have that finished mm, okay so but that's why we put as much uh as much as we felt comfortable with the stuff that was excised to at least give you an idea of of kind of what was in there mm-hmm. through the behind the scenes stuff and you know some photos and the stuff we talk about. Yeah. And this is, this is an excellent <clears throat> Blu-ray release from Scream Factory. It didn't get the collector's edition treatment, although no. it's, it's loaded with more extras than <laughs> a, a good deal of their collector's edition releases. So um, if you're a fan of the Hills Run Red, then this is just a must own. If you're so. not a fan of the Hills Run Red, you might like it. But you might like the extras because it's like, well, here's how, here's how a movie, here's how a movie's made in Bulgaria. It's almost, it's almost like a mini film school in some, in some respects. They should hand it to you. If you're, if they're, if you're going to go shoot a film in Bulgaria, you need to, yeah, to yeah, watch here, take a look at this. See, see what you're dealing with. Yeah. 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 I, I've actually noticed some, some talk of, of there was talk of a sequel uh, or well, in the chat, people oh, were okay. asking about a sequel. And um, I actually, I, I know you, you had said that there was really, there was no interest in doing a sequel or you thought there would be no interest in doing a sequel. Did you ever think about doing a sequel or would you, you just moved on? Uh, I mean, we entered, I think Scow and I entertained it for maybe like five, five minutes. Like, Oh, what would we do if, but I mean, it was pretty clear, you know, that there wasn't, and Warner premiere went away and then silver pictures left Warner brothers. So I don't even know who, if you could do one and you know it was like okay you know the you know the reality is too if the movie had actually set the world on fire and rented and sold really well back in the day and i think it did fine they they had their money recouped before they released it um then they might have considered it but you know i don't know i don't think they you know i don't know if they gave it the the real push either um Except to, you know, I think they just assume like, well, the horror fans will find it. And, and there you go. I mean, it was in all the stores and everything, yeah. but, oh, yeah. but it also got really the same day that the movie was released. Trick or treat. Mike Doherty's film was released the same day by the same company. Uh, so that got all the push. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I couldn't argue that because that movie was a much more expensive movie and a much better movie, but they got, but, but, Warner brothers got cold feet with it because of the, the kids drowning in the bus. Mm. They're like, Oh, this is too disturbing. It's like, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I, I posted a link asking who wants a Hills run red sequel. And we got nearly 400 votes. Wow. 40% said, yay. 18% said, nay. 42% 42% said yay, but only if Piz plays Babyface. <laughs> so there you go. It's possible. There you go. It's possible. The funny thing is, um, the actor who the actor stuntman who played Babyface actually was Bruce Campbell's stunt double for Ash versus the Evil Dead, the series. He looked like he was having so much fun. He had a lot of fun. He really enjoyed it. He's such a good guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> at first I was like, I don't know, but it was like, yeah, well, you know, it was like, I was so lucky, you know, uh-huh. so yeah. lucky to have him. So yeah, the people have spoken. I wish I could make it happen for you guys, but I'm going to have to just try to like come up there's, with another slasher. But I mean, look, there's, <laughs> there's some slashers that benefit from not being sequelized. I mean, look at the burning, look at Madman, look at my bloody Valentine. It's there's something special about those movies because yeah, but my bloody Valentine was reborn. It, it was, it yeah. was, it was very well, by the way. 
<laughs> I really like that one. Indeed, um, I, I, I've spoken to both of the the depraved minds behind that film. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess so, but you know, it, but it's, I mean, it's a, it's a weird thing. I mean, the mutilators coming back, the mutilators coming back. <laughs> you know, who would have thought that I know buddy Cooper didn't think that would be happening. <laughs> That's true. Know? That's true. Uh, the, the dark night of the scarecrow came back. I mean, you just, yeah. You know, I mean, maybe yeah. it shouldn't have. I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't Are seen you, it, so I don't know. I, I've yeah. not seen it. I love the original. I know it's I the same too. guy. It's the same guy who did the original doing the sequel, but uh, we'll see. Are, are you yeah. are, are you the kind of filmmaker who only sees the flaws when you go back and look at your work? I don't go back and look at my work. So, yeah. Really? So, yeah, I don't. I don't. You, you just don't even want to go there? No, because, uh, yeah, because I'm going to see the mistakes. I'm going to mm. see, like, oh, why didn't I? I should have done that. I should, why didn't I do? I just you know just look at it's so obvious now um yeah i don't i don't mm. really um yeah it's not it's at this at least at this point in time it's not not a real fun process yeah <laughs> it was uh it was bittersweet doing the hills just because again rob burdett and i did all the special features ourselves we, it was right when the the pandemic hit and we all went into lockdown so we were doing it as that was happening in the early stages of it. So it was, it was very, it was good to be busy and have something to take my mind off it, but it was, it was weird looking back. Right. You know, I do want to mention um, we're, we're creeping toward the Q and a section of the uh, stream. Cool. I have posted um, the actual link. If you want to join us to jump on and ask Dave a question, face to face, so to speak, uh, for my patrons and channel members. So if you're a patron or a channel member and you want to jump on and, uh, ask, uh, Dave a question, those links are posted and, um, I'll make the link available to everybody here shortly. And if you've got questions for Dave, go ahead and start throwing those in, uh, in the chat and I'll try to, uh, keep, keep track of them. Um, sure. How much of being a filmmaker is dealing with frustration and disappointment? I mean, I think it's different for every filmmaker. It depends on their level of success and everything. But I think there's a huge, I mean, there, there's definitely a huge percentage of that. Sure. Um, you know, the people that I know, a lot of the people in the room that I know, you know, they put their heart and soul into these things. I mean, you know, what, regardless of how they come out, um, so yeah, if something doesn't happen or it goes south or something, it, yeah, it's disappointing. Um, the trick is, and I always use this and, and, and I've gotten somewhat better. People who know me in the room don't say anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I started using, I, I honestly started using this mantra after I saw this movie and I heard it. And I've got it literally on my wall over here. And it's like, it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Mm, From I like Rocky that. Balboa. You know? I like so that. it really is that. And look, this is a disappointing business. I mean, the thing, the thing that, you know, you walk into this business not really knowing most of the time is that it is so, it seems like it's so easy, but it is so much harder then you realize, and it takes a monumental amount of work. And, you know, there are times you can just get burnt out and it's like, I just don't have it in me. Mm -hmm. I don't have the, I don't have the fire. I don't have the drive. Obviously Ralph Kineski is an exception since he just had six movies made. In <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He is a writing machine. The, the man's he a machine. A writing machine. That yes. guy, I, I get so pissed off at him. I mean, in, in a good way, because it's like, he'll come up with an idea and then, boom, it just seems like the script's there. I just like, wow. It's like, I wish I could do that, but I, um, but I'm an overthinker. So I overthink and, and I'll, I'll end up talking myself out of an idea faster than I would probably actually writing it. So, um, but again, I think that's also, uh, but again, you know, it's different. What I say when it's different for everyone is because, you know, everyone has a, a very different, um, path and different successes and disappointments. So, you know, some people are a little higher up on the food chain. So 
they might have more shots, you know, uh, you know, more times at bat, sort of, so to speak. Whereas, you know, right now, I mean, right now I'm kind of like, I'm in this weird spot where it's like, well, no one in the business, you know, in the hiring business knows who the fuck I am anymore. So in a way it's good because I could, um, I could come up with something or even a short or something and be discovered again. Um, but it's also tough because it's like, well, who the fuck are you? Even though you have all this experience, it, you know, these things, you know, none of the, none of the stuff that I made is like a real huge, like barometer to people like go, Oh yeah. You know, there's not, I, I doubt there's some executive at one of these studios. It's a huge Hills Run Red fan and go, I got to find this guy. So, mm. so I think what my point being with that is that um, with the overthinking, um, I think it's uh, one of those things where it's like you, and it's stupid, but you start putting so much importance on the next thing that you do, that it's got to be great that it can just stop you dead from doing mm -hmm. something. So yeah, it's about learning how to like not think about that stuff. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, and, and just have fun. And that's what I've, that's what I've actually started to do now because it, the, the, you know, it, it's an old quote from William Goldman and it's totally true. And I probably should have had it, you know, tattooed on my forehead. Nobody knows anything in this business <laughs> you know you could come up with oh that's the stupidest idea in the world could be a hit nobody knows anything until it's a hit or it's not right right uh jamie mentions in the chat it takes a lot of resilience to be a horror filmmaker getting the movies made is so hard sometimes and then dealing with the reaction afterwards can be brutal Respect Thanks, you, Jamie. You're, you're damn right, and you know, and and you know, and Rolf knows, and Jay knows, and Todd knows. Um, but I mean, honestly, and it's no offense to people, but I don't look at you know, uh, the last thing that's sort of that really sort of publicly that came out was Tales of Halloween, and I didn't look at a review for six months. I just like I don't, um, I just don't do it. You know, I just, uh, yeah, because I, you know, it's like, you got to learn to like, just let that stuff roll off your back. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Again, nobody knows anything, you know? And the thing is, you know, a lot of the time, I, you know, and I'm fine with the good criticism. I hate when, you know, and, you know, social media and a lot of these things, and I'm sure you know it too. A lot of, the, a lot of these people like make like make it personal. Oh yeah. And I, I'm just like. It's just a movie. <laughs> you know? People take it. I mean, you know, we were, we were talking about Texas Chainsaw Massacre and, you know, I, I, I loved that movie, but you know, some people really, really hated it. And you get those, I get those comments. I get, Oh, I can't imagine. I hope the director isn't looking at the reviews. I mean, again, it's a success for him because they can go, right. Hey, look, it's number three on Netflix. Great. You know, move on. I hope he's smart enough to do that because there's no winning with, especially with that series. Mm -hmm. You're talking about like the gone with the wind of horror movies as the first one, even right. Toby Hooper couldn't eclipse his first movie much in the same way that Romero in perception couldn't eclipse night of the living dead. And it's like, and, and they made it. So I can't imagine what it's like for someone who has to step in and, and be in that, you know, that massive shadow of, mm -hmm. of that movie. It's like, mm -hmm. you, you, you can't, you can't win in that yeah. sense, except, you know, you can, you it, know. there, there seems to have, there seems to be, and maybe it's like a microcosm of the political landscape in the world. And I don't even want to talk about go anywhere near politics, but there's such a divide where, if you like a movie that I hate, that's somehow an insult. I, 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 that's a, that's a personal affront to me. Right. Um, when, when I did my, um, I reviewed Halloween kills when it first came out and I hated mm -hmm. Halloween kills. Hated okay. Halloween kills. I got th the first time I've gotten hate mail in years, wow. years. And it was as if I had insulted someone's child, <laughs> literally 
it's it like was. it's just another Halloween movie, guys. Right, but <laughs> no, not, really, not, you know. not to some people. It was uh, not to some people. I know. And um, yes, yeah, some really interesting hate mail calling me. Um, and and they, they didn't like, you know, like you're stupid. You're dumb. They were like, you must be a Biden supporter if you didn't like Halloween kills. Like, what does that oh. have to do with anything? Right. Because you're dumb. I, I guess. I don't know. I was like, <laughs> why? It's like, you, you know, do with? it's like, yeah. Why, I, yeah. yeah. Just, um, just really people get really worked up about these things and it's um, it's nice is it, look it's nice it's nice that people have passion for these movies i wish they could spread it yes. out among more movies yes you know yes. i love I, you know horror fans are the best i mean they really are um and they really are passionate about um what they love spread it around be open to other things because then maybe we can get some new Horror. But that's my thing it's like for the most part we haven't had really too many you know we had the you know the universal monsters era mm -hmm. and then you know as far as characters go then the 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 golden age of the slasher era and stuff like that but where's our where's our new batch we need our new batch oh that that's something i i, I was going to definitely bring up a little later but i mean we can go ahead and talk about it now and and todd commented on it just recently it's tough to do anything new in a world where the check writers want remakes and horror based on 1980s toy lines yeah it's it's something that gets brought up um in the in the horror fan community it's, it's really kind of a debate between new ips versus the legacy titles and the legacy titles get all the all the marketing and the big theatrical push and you know what i mean they make all the money at the box office and well the it's new easy IPs, because they're pre-sold People right. don't have to work as hard. And the new IPs get swallowed up on a streaming service. And unless right. you do your research and really seek them out. And much as much as I love shutter, it doesn't have the, uh, it doesn't have the visibility yet. <coughs> you know, right. like, like my, my top 10 favorite movies of last year were all like original IPs, but they were all movies that were on literally they were on shutter. Like I think eight of the 10 of them were on shutter and you, right how I discovered them was I, I literally just, I mean, it was, it was like I was researching a, a paper for college or something. Um, and I had to seek them out. Yeah. What I'd love, I would, I'd love to see it, which might actually, um, uh, I, and, and, and actually Jay in the room makes a good point. Uh, it's not just horror. You know, people are, you know, I mean, look at the things that come into theaters now. I mean, you know, again, like I used to, I used to watch everything. You know, you look at what's coming out in theaters now. Well, someone like Sidney Lumet, who was one of our greatest directors, would you know would never have a movie out in theaters now because they don't make they don't play those movies. He did like The Verdict and you know, you know, all, you know the you know these amazing movies. But you know, we're missing a lot. Everything now is big IP spectacle for the most. I mean, 90 percent of it is you know. So it's like, and that's getting the big push instead of like, you know, and everything else is just going to streaming. But, um, but getting back to horror, I would love to see Joe Bob actually premiere new movies, mm. maybe just do bookends. But I think because of his presence and his success on shutter and visibility, that might help break through, a, you know, some of these things in a, in a bigger way. Yeah. Yeah. That would be a, uh, I think that would be cool. Um, we have a follow-up here from Mr. Farmer, a follow-up photo. Oh, hold on. No. Hold on. I, I don't know. I don't, let's see. <laughs> Hopefully this won't get me banned off YouTube. Oh, wait, but no, it's a, it's a follow-up. Uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> That's when I finally noticed what he was doing. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. So, <sighs> when I have less hair and, but I still have more than him. <laughs> oh goodness gracious uh you you mentioned tales from halloween which I, I i i love tales from halloween uh you directed this segment sweet tooth mm -hmm. um it, it, for those who don't know tales of halloween it's a halloween themed horror anthology um you directed um a segment alongside people like darren lynn uh, bowsman bowsman uh lucky mckee and uh Paul Neil Marshall Sawyer. among many other Marshall Mike Mendez mm -hmm. Axel Carolyn yeah yeah how, that was did, that was my that in in some way 
that's the one that I'm the most pleased with how it came out. Hmm. Uh, again, we were, we were, you know, um, it was a low budget film. So, you know, we had producers that were actually really great and just sort of let us do what we wanted to do. It wasn't really a lot of like, Oh, you can't do this. You can't do that. Um, and, and we had the support of, you know, all the people that we were working with because we worked sort of as a collective and we shared our stories together and got notes and everything else from each other. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm very happy with how that one came out. It's very traditional compared to some of the other shorts in it. Um, mm -hmm. But I like that, uh, you know, but I like that fact. And, and it was uh, it, funny enough. Um, it was, uh, in part due to Rolf Kanaski, we were having lunch and I was like trying, you know, it, it was one of these things where everyone was coming up their story and they all started taking like all the tropes like, Oh, this guy's doing a witch and this guy's doing a jack-o'-lantern and this like, what am I going to do? Oh, this one's doing trick or treating and stuff. Like, what do I do? And Rolf suggested, well, what about a candy monster? And I think he met one that was made out of literal candy. I was like, no, I don't think we can pull that off or anything like that. But literally right after that, it just sweet tooth just clicked in my head. And within the next, you know, couple minutes, I had the entire thing mapped out, which was great. And that's never happened where I was like, I knew exactly what all the beats were and I was ready to go. Right. So, yeah, I really enjoyed that one. But again, I, th I think if there's a through line, um, with my work, it's like, I like horror characters. So I guess I'm desperately trying to get an action figure or something out of one of these <laughs> things because, you know, Dead Hate the Living had, uh, you know, the two zombies and Charlie was making toys at the time. It's like, well, you can make toys of those. Which I'm surprised did. he didn't. I'm surprised I, he didn't. I don't know. Um, then Hills and then Tales of Halloween. Yeah, I like, I like, I like horror characters. It'd be great to, it would be, it would be so fun. I, I, again, I, I have a feeling that it's time has passed because the movie is, you know, now what, seven years old that, and we talked about trying to do a, a sweet tooth feature, but the company that made tales of Halloween wasn't interested. So mm. I don't really know if there's an, a, a real desire. I, you know, but we, I worked on a, a treatment and stuff for a, a, what I called sweet tooth full size. Mm. <laughs> like, like a full size candy bar is a full movie. So, but um, yeah. What about a uh, tales from Hall tales of Halloween too? No, I I don't think so. Uh, yeah, I, the thing is, um, well, one everyone you know, Mike's doing something, uh, Axel's doing something, and they were sort of the producers, you know, overseers of it. Um, and Axel was like, mm -hmm. I don't know if um. I don't know if uh, we would want to do another one because we managed to make Tales of Halloween and still all be friends. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, second time, maybe not so much. And the other thing is now there are so many, there's so many anthologies. What, what, what new are we going to really bring to it? That I mean, so many, you know, so many of them, there's so many of them now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, would it be fair to call it watches an experimental film? very fair <laughs> so uh um yeah i did that movie with my friend Ivan jerovic um and how it happened was when i got done hills i was i was working in i was editing reality television and i worked on this show called lost tapes lost tapes was uh basically like mini blair witch movies found footage movies <laughs> with cryptids in them and uh i directed a couple of those and um avon actually played the creature in the two that i directed and so we just started hanging around and it was after hills where i had nine producers to answer to mm. and i was like you know i just want to have an experience where i don't have to answer to anyone i know we have no money and it was made for nothing, but we had a house, we had a location oh, who's, and whose house was that? By the way, that was an awesome house. I can't say, <laughs> I cannot say the house. Um, and please people who know me don't say whose house it was in the chat. 
Um, so anyway, so we had this house location and what we did is again, I just wanted, I wanted to have an entire 180 total opposite experience from the studio system. So we wrote a 30 page outline and the entire movie was improv and there was no prep except for like, literally we would, we would make, we would find the shots on the day. And we were kind of just, we had, we had the outline, but that was it. And it was all improv and that's what came, <laughs> and that's what came out. <laughs> and it was just, uh, it was, it was, it was, it was cool. It was a lot of work. It was hard. It was fun. Um, I got to, I mean, I, I got to practice and, you know, basically, it, you know, it's a movie uh, of, of practicing and, and, and doing different things and experimenting in that way. And, and we got it released, uh, mm. terrible reviews, mm. <laughs> but again, you know, it's like for what, for the stuff, there's stuff in it that I really like that I really think works that I want to improve on uh as far as my s directing skills go and like composition skills and everything and i got to work with will barrett who shot the hatchet movies and he was amazing to work with and i got to work with jimmy duvall and oh. uh, you know I, I love him to death and he's fantastic and a, and a good friend and you know working with yvonne and i you know the nice thing is whether the movie like really is a success it's it's kind of interesting it's very it's slow it's a slow burn but i was like i was inspired right or wrong at the time from some of the, the mumble core things and some of like the house of the devil and, you know, mm -hmm. those type of movies. But again, they had, they had a full script and everything and, and we didn't. So, um, there were, I just there, sort of wanted, I just sort of wanted to see what happens. Um, there were a lot of things about the movie that I liked. Um, and then I, there's I, some I, real head scratchers. Well, yeah, there, there's stuff. That, yeah, yeah, there's some head scratchers, but there's there's a lot of stuff in that movie that I I, I genuinely did like. Well, thank you. I, I'm glad. I'm glad. I uh, there's stuff that I do like too, but it's you know, uh, how, you know, how difficult was it to find a distributor for that film? It was tricky. Uh, it, yeah, it was a little tricky, um, but then we got uncorked and they were like, yeah, we'll put this out. But I mean, that's the thing there is there, at least at that time, which was a couple of years ago, you know, if the movie was, you know, shot decently and it was mixed decently, you know, they're really not spending any money to release these things. They're spending very little. So it's very little. It's very little risk on their part. To, you know to put these out so i mean i think i mean that's the thing if you you look at Tubi tv some of the stuff you, you're like this isn't even mixed <laughs> you know so i mean it's like i don't quality control you know qc i don't know how some of these things pass it but you know we had to you know mm -hmm. with that movie you know i would make sure of that anyway but um yeah so um it was, a, it was a little bit of a challenge. It wasn't like we're in a bidding war. <laughs> there wasn't a bidding war with it, but well, I mean, it was originally called Cold Water, which they, of course, changed the title because It Follows was very big. And it was like, that was kind of the, if we wanted it released, that was kind of the conceit. And, you know, because I did this with someone else, it was like, we've waited long enough. Just put it out there. I'm like, okay, all right. Yeah. Well, and that that's one of the thing with, one of the things with, like you know a, a new ip that we didn't talk about you know step one getting it made and then step two distributing it you know you've got two huge hurdles to jump with an original you know um and it, it it can't be easy no no and it was uh well yeah and and it didn't uh, you know, honestly it didn't have a lot of like really marketable kind of you know outwardly marketable things it's you know it's a slow burn creepy thing about one guy in a house who is not known so, right. um, you know, that's, that's not the easiest thing to put on a box. Excuse me. Hit my head. So, you know, so that was a challenge too. Whereas, you know, you could have someone with, you know, you could have one of these movies with no one in it, but you know, there's a Jack in the box in the movie. So there you go. You can put him on the cover, <laughs> you know, as just <laughs> as an example. So it's like, yeah, there were, there wasn't any sort of like outwardly, you know, exploitable, you know, elements for promotion to like make a box that was like really cool or anything like that. 
Right. Uh, Jay is having to leave. Jay, thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks, tonight, Jay. Man. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that link. Uh, uh, yeah. Appreciate it, man. Yeah. We actually have uh, someone in the green room who wants to jump on and, uh -oh. um, and say hello. Okay. So let's go ahead and bring this individual on. It's Jamie Blanks. Hey, hey. wearing a cannon shirt. Come on. <laughs> awesome. I just wanted to say good day, Dave. I really enjoyed your um, chat. It was very interesting to hear about all the uh, stories Thank you. you've gone through. We I, have um, met before, you know. Yeah, yeah. We yeah, have hung out with, with 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 Burnett. Like, yeah, I, I right. think around when Valentine was opening. Exactly. Yeah, it was around Pretty that sure. time. Yeah, yeah, I haven't seen Robert in a long time, but he's such a great guy. I really loved hanging out with him. We had a lot, a lot of good times together. Yeah, well, you should. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, let me know how to get in touch with you. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll, connect I'll send you. all my details through Justin. Perfect, because then I'll connect you with him. I bet I'm be sure great. he'd be he'd be thrilled. Yeah, no, he's a lovely guy. Really, um, really very fond of him. But man, it was a great chat. I thought you really explained some stuff that people might not understand about filmmaking. Um, how difficult it can be. How how those long periods of waiting and all of a sudden it's hurry up and go. And it's yeah. um, it's a tough gig, you know. It's, well, uh, it, the other thing, and uh, you know, I'm sure you've talked about this too. It's it's important to find uh, you know other things also to you know fill the time <laughs> yeah. to do other yeah. things that you enjoy too. Like I do a lot of like, uh, like Photoshop stuff and, and things like that. Just do like, right. just, you know, and I know you're a composer, so you yeah, I, I do lots of editing. Um, I'm still doing commercials and corporates. I've got to, you've got to stay busy. You've got to get yeah. hands on the tools. Otherwise when it time, comes time to make a movie, you're, you're rusty. So yeah, I've, I've managed to stay busy, which is great. Um, which is awesome. Yeah. And, it's, you're it's, not, and you're not here, which is also another blessing. <laughs> you know? It has been the last couple of years, although this morning my poor son just um, he had a COVID positive test, so he's isolating in his bedroom. for. Oh. Two, um, the, the good news is for him, he's been practicing isolating in his bedroom for years. He plays <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this funny. It was like, Oh man, don't you don't you find this you know staying at home really tough? It's like me, I can actually work from home and I don't have to drive an hour in LA traffic to yeah. go to work and edit. I mean, I'm like, like, editors, we, it's like it an, this is great. Olymp, we could represent our country if it was an Olympic sport. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's awesome. I'm like, yeah, this is great. Only recently, I'm like, yeah, I I, I, I got to get out. I got to get out of this place. The walls are closing in, but. Um, <laughs> So you're having you got some stuff you're working on at the moment that that's keeping you. I'm, yeah, excited. I'm start. Well, I'm start. Well, one thing I one thing I got was I got I got the uh, the new iPhone. So I'm going to be messing around with that camera. I've um, got the same phone. It's fantastic. It's and there's I, and I just found there's like anamorphic lenses you can get for. It, yeah, <laughs> which yeah, I'm yeah. like, like all right. Um, and I've seen people shoot stuff and it looks. It looks better than it watches. I mean, it's higher quality uh, than the Dave, camera. I, I bought the phone. I'm, I'm still on an iPhone 7, which I use as my actual phone. But I bought the new iPhone just for the camera after I saw Catherine Bigelow and Greg Fraser's test where they shot all that action stuff. Yeah. There. It's like, okay, if she can get those kind of images out of it. Um, like I've got a $4,000 Canon 5D Mark III that sits in the case now. Yeah. I just use the phone. Oh, right. wow. I may have phone, to, phone I may quality have to, is amazing. I may have yeah, to upgrade yeah. my... It's got Galaxy high then. dynamic range, Justin, so you can have a uh, darkened interior and a bright window outside, and they're both perfectly exposed in the frame. So yeah. yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Cool. It's incredibly intuitive. So that's exciting. And then, yeah, and then I'm, I'm, where, yeah, I am, uh, I'm developing. I've got a couple of new ideas because I finally was like, I don't care if this seems like the dumbest idea of the world. I kind of like it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just do it. I'm gonna write it and create this thing for the fun of doing it, and not worry Absolutely. about where it goes. Which yeah, is the big thing that you should follow, always be doing. Follow your passions always, man. It's it's always going to lead the best result. And, and you, it's, it's just a matter of finding the right people. Like you talked about the producers that supported you on Tales from Halloween. I've made four films and I've had uh, two great experiences with producers and not so great on the other two. And it makes right, the world right. of difference. Yeah, it's, it does. So I many mean, battles you don't need to fight when you're actually on the same team making the same movie. Yeah, it, it's a huge, it's a huge difference. And, you know, it's it, being on set is a pretty stressful thing because all you feel is that clock ticking every, 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 every Absolutely. second you feel, yeah. you know, so to have someone who is there alleviating some of the pressure is a lot better yeah. than someone who's adding to it. Yeah. Someone who's actually thinking a couple of steps ahead yeah. to make the most of your shooting day. I mean, it's, it's night and day. It's amazing. Mm. But um, mm. yeah. And right now, funny enough, I'm doing, I'm sort of, 
doing uh, one idea I'm doing sort of the Charlie band way. Like I came up with a title and then I hooked up with an artist who is now doing like a piece of poster art for me. And for the past month, we've just been talking about it before he's done the sketch. <laughs> and he just gave me the sketch before the actually doing the painting. And it's like, that's it. hundred percent. No change is done. Go. So, yeah, yeah. so well, that, a lot and, of and, and go, that way. <laughs> and the thing is going through that process actually helped me th- uh, of what like what I want on the poster helped me figure out the story, which was really a different, just a different way to do it. Yeah, that's that's a really cool approach. Actually, I often do that stuff with with music too. I was mm-hmm. watching Top Gun the other day, and I remember Harold Faltermeyer delivered that Top Gun theme to those guys on the second week of production. So, so they're listening wow. to that theme as they're shooting the movie. Right. Sometimes these creative things you do at the start really help drive. I mean, I did a storm warning concept poster. That ended up we, we used elements of that in the in the costume design and stuff. So mm-hmm. it's very helpful to, to start with some vision that can expand on from there. Now, I, I, now that I got you here, I want to ask you this: Storm Morning was was that all interior? Was it interior it was, done well, exterior? Yeah, it was everything at the farm was shot on the stage. Well, wow. obviously there's there's exterior stuff at the beginning there in the mangrove right. maze, and there's the cliffs. And obviously, that's all outdoor. But once they get to the farmhouse, that was all interior. The, How the, cool the interior is interior and the outside of the farmhouse was an interactive set, which I could pull walls out of. And wow. That was a dream. I That's never, so I cool. Like, I never want to do another film any other way. It was just, I mean, having control over the elements. Yeah, yeah, Melbourne, yeah. Australia, where it's like we have a saying, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. You know, this is, yeah. changing. That's, that's how yeah. we, that's, yeah, I experienced that when I was in New Zealand. Right. <laughs> it, was, it would change all the time. It's like, yeah, wow, it's I had crazy. The, the total opposite experience when I did my next movie, which was Long Weekend, which was all outdoors. There's barely anything in, inside. Right. Am- amazingly, the weather played ball for me that uh, until the very last shot when it came, it started raining for three days. So it was like <sighs> we had been wrapped, you know, by. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. <laughs> that's awesome. That's so cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I just dropped the link in the chat if anybody else wants to jump on and say hello or ask Dave a question or. And you're working, Jamie, you're working with Mike Thorne right now. I'm, do, I'm doing a bunch of stuff at the moment. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you about it offline. Um, later. Okay. Like what I'm doing. But yeah, my, I, I met Mike on Twitter and he and I have become very good mates and he's got tons of ideas. So yeah, there's a few things I'm cooking up with, with Mike. I, I'm a huge fan of his writing. Yeah. His stuff but also is really working good. with some other in, incredible people too, that I'm just so excited about. But um, at the moment I have to stay. No, right, yeah. In, in, just, Justin knows all about it, but uh, yeah. Yep. Don't jinx it. Can't talk about it. That's right. Can't talk about That's it. Right. Can't talk about it. Yeah. Uh, I do have a question here from a viewer. Uh, okay. Dirk Dirk Hall would like to know what was the hardest part for you about getting into the business? Getting a car. <laughs> <laughs> when you're broken, you need a car in LA to drive anywhere. So that was that was a little tricky. Uh, one of the hard, yeah i mean look none of it's none of it's easy it's all it all takes a lot of work it all takes a lot of work you know none of it none of it's none of it's been uh yeah I, no, nothing's ever been just gifted to me it's all it's all been like putting in the hours putting in the work yeah my buddy christian would like to know uh, does Dave know about how many copies of the dead hit the, the dead hate the living were sold back in the day and how successful was it? It did. It, I don't know exactly how many copies I know it did really well. It was nominated for the video software dealers association, like, you know, independent release of the 2000 or something like that. So I think that's cause it sold well. Um, it seems to pop up at a lot of flea markets and you know eBay for a dollar. So you know, I guess I guess uh, yeah, I guess it did all right. Uh, my buddy Keith, Captain Halloween, would like to know who were your influences. Um, uh, that uh, John Carpenter, Romero, uh, for sure. Those two, Coscarelli, Phantasm mm-hmm. is my favorite uh, mm-hmm. horror series. So mm-hmm. I love. I love Don's imagination. He continues mm. to blow me away with, with what he does. And I, I you know, I, I'm envious too, because I loved how he shot John ties at the end by shooting it mm. a couple of days and then taking like maybe taking a week off. And then it was just like, you know, not rushing it. Um, Don's brilliant. Yeah. And he's, brilliant. and he's so with the, you know, 
even within the Phantasm films, but outside of it, when you know, Bubba Hotep and John dies at the end and mm-hmm. Kenny and company. And, you know, he's so diverse. He really yeah. is. And he's, he doesn't get, he does not get the uh, credit or attention that he, I think really deserves. No, he's also one of the nicest, kindest people in the fucking world. That guy. Yeah, he is. He's a, I he's come to amazing. LA, he lends me a spare car. <laughs> he's, don't a car. he's amazing. It, as long he's as it's amazing. not the Cuda. If it's the Cuda, I'm going to be really jealous. The yeah. the oh, <laughs> Cuda. oh I, I would love to have that hearse. You know, I, give I'd me that hearse. I'd love to meeting in the hearse. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Uh, Joe Reese would like to know, uh, Dave, were you ever offered any uh, Dimension films back in the 90s? No, I was not offered any. I did pitch there. <clears throat> I pitched. I'm the son of a bitch who pitched Halloween, which was Hellraiser and Halloween together. Wow. I was the one who first pitched that over there <laughs> because well, well, tell they us were making that. Freddy versus Jason. <laughs> and at the time, uh, around that time, Scott Spiegel was doing From Dust Till Dawn 2. They had me cut a rough trailer for like a sales reel for that movie for them. And while I was there, I had just come up with this idea. So I took footage from both movies and I cut together this little trailer for Halloween. And I had someone do a a, a pretty crude at the time, uh, CGI uh, skull pumpkin from two that at a certain point, the eyes lit up and the pins came out of it. That's my (laughs) final image. I'm like, (laughs) that would be amazing. It was such a (laughs) dorky thing. But yeah, so um yeah they uh (laughs) it was yeah it was my because i was like oh uh you know it was like well how do they get how how are these two you know together this is kind of taking shape two which is the book about all the unmade um halloween movies covers it they interviewed me so the real history is in that thing but um i don't remember the whole story i just I, i i remember that uh uh, Kirsty Cotton is, uh, they're going to de- finally destroy the Myers house. Kirsty Cotton goes in, she's looking for something and she finds a Hellraiser box stuck in the wall. So what happened is the night that Michael killed his sister, when he was going trick or treating, the, the, the homeless bum from Hellraiser gave him a box and he opened it. And this, the demon Solwyn or Sam Hain from two, takes Michael over and that's why he's unkillable and that's why he is evil and you know unstoppable. So you got Kirsty and these group of people in there. <laughs> and Michael of course shows up and boom then Pinhead shows up and says you've escaped hell it's time to come back. They have a fight and everything and then the third act takes place in hell in the in the quarters of hell the labyrinth of hell with Michael Myers stalking. The oh my goodness! <laughs> it would have made a ton of money. It we've we've actually we've actually got somebody else in the green room. Okay, who actually did his own Halloween movie for, oh. or, or, or had written a Halloween movie. Well, we know who that is. <laughs> and that's, it's well, me. Hey, it's you. <laughs> Welcome to the shed. Tool shed. <laughs> How's it going, Todd? It's good. How are you guys? Good, good brother. It's good to see you, man. Three of my favorite people in the same stream. <laughs> it's been so long since I've seen you, man. I know. I hugged you last time. We should hug again now that the I world's know. kind of at the, at the R-rated again. speakeasy. I know, right? Jeez, that was lovely. That was. I, I, Todd, how was Ireland, man? It looked like a lot of fun. It was lovely. I was only there for three months before they kicked me out. Uh, <laughs> they probably you can three only months? stay. Yeah, you can only stay for three months, ah. Un- unless you're, you know, have a passport, which I don't have. It looked like a fun time. I have, en- yeah, I did. I have enjoyed this stream. I, I yeah, admit, man. there were times when you were talking, we were telling stories, and I was like, "Wow, oh, this is like my story. <laughs> <laughs> this hurts so bad listening yeah. to this. I just want to curl oh, up in a it ball." It was an emotional cry. journey, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm like the uh, Oprah. Of uh, horror, uh, <laughs> yeah. there you go. Horrors, horrors, Oprah. Yeah, I, 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 I pull the tears out of people. Yeah, 
the bar- and everybody the in the chat wins a car of, of horror. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you want to be known as. There we go. Hey, I didn't yeah. cry. <laughs> just, just inwardly. Yeah, inwardly. Not, no, not on the outside. Just me. Just I cried listening. Oh, but it, I mean, it, it is the interesting most, how right. you know your 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 stories. It's like you've had the similar experiences of getting screwed over or, or getting, you know, it, it's like, it, that's the business almost yeah. there. That's a good chunk of the business. You know, you got to be resilient. You got to, you got to have it in you. You got to be patient. You've got to be tough. You got to be, Oh, you got to pull out the creativity when it's needed. It's, it's, it's a, not for everybody. That's for sure. No. Yeah, absolutely not. Uh, and, and, and most of the time you'll question if it's even for you. Yeah. <laughs> I am maybe it's not. But, I, but I, sure I get those times where I'm like, I don't know if I'm really meant to be here. Anymore. But I think we're all driven by that same thing. We all love the genre so much. It's like, what else? I mean, I can't imagine to be anything else. It's, There's nothing funnier than happy. being on a movie set, making no. a movie. That's it's, right. I mean, is with all the pressure and everything else, it is so much. I mean, it is what? so much fun, especially when we work really in a business where we can keep our severed heads in our cabin. <laughs> that's right. Oh my God. With our drills and everything else. Yeah. That's the business we work in. Who yeah. else gets to do that? <laughs> no one else gets to. Well, I mean, there are some. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, has, has anybody ever stumbled upon your severed head, Todd? Like they're, you know, you're, they're looking for a drill. Like, oh my God. Yes. The, uh, the, the gardeners. <laughs> came in and gonna, i said i they, they texted me and i was like just go in the shed there's stuff in there and and the guy who owns the company called and said yeah he won't go in your shed because there's stuff in there <laughs> what tools no there's like a head in there and there's we, a corpse because there is a corpse in the back i don't know if you can see him right that's the we had a photorealistic me. um uh, pr- a dummy made up of one of the actors in storm warning who gets eaten by his own dog from the groin so it's oh. a whole cavity <laughs> and it's a realistic head so thing. subtle we had it at the wrap party and they put filled it full of ice and it was it's where we kept all the beers right yeah it's so perfect the next morning the cleaner came in it was still there and and called the police <laughs> <laughs> it looked like some bizarre ritual had taken place there or something <laughs> Oh, that's geez. perfect. And, and, and you mean to tell me, I, I posted the invite link in the chat and nobody wants to jump on with, with, with this crew. I mean, I think people are just intimidated. P- people are rating killer. Yeah, we're, 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 we're so scared. <laughs> Ooh, I'm surprised nobody's wanted to jump on and say hello. This seems but- crazy. We have not made more movies than most people. Yeah, no, we're very selective, guys. Come on, we choose. We choose very carefully. We, we have we have delusions of Kubrick. What are you talking about? <laughs> but I, you know, now now I, I, no I have, wine before it's time. I have yeah. I have three brilliant minds here in in where in, in the in the filmmaking landscape. I, I, I'd like for you guys to imp- to individually impart um, some. Uh, wise words to any aspiring filmmakers or writers out there today. D- D- Dave, go first. Oh, I, I, I get to go first. <laughs> How? I was I was waiting for those two, so I would have a moment to think about it. But um, um, trust your gut. Go with your gut. Always go with your gut. Whether you, th- I mean, I mean, one. Don't be a dick either. If you're in this business and everything, yeah. you know, being a dick is, is, you know, I, you know, I know there's a lot of stories of directors and people who are difficult and everything else, but you know, um, you get so much more, you know, not being that way. Um, exactly. You know, there are going to be times where you're going to have to like put your foot down or yell or, 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 you know, make it known, but you can't always be that way. If you are, I think it's, you know, especially now they won't even put up with that shit. Be a good, be be a good person. It'll catch you. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more, Dave. You get so much more out of people that way. If you have a happy set and everyone feels supported, um, you get your work done quicker too. And it's better work. Oh yeah. It's a bit extra time to to do a little bit of improv around the script. If you, if you, if you're in a good groove and the actors are giving something, 
I think um, you've got to have a you've got to have a light, fun set. You got to you got to keep to the schedule. You got to drive it all. But I agree with everything you said. It's a, it's a it's a wonderful way to be. You've got to be kind to everybody because it's 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 easy to be kind and easy going when things are going smoothly. It's 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 when you're under pressure. That's the test of character. You've got yeah. to maintain that when when things get tough. Um, I like think a good director yeah, is Rob, steady Eddie. Rolf agrees, but I, when I initially read that, I thought it said yes. Choose your bottles wisely. Well, that's it. Well, I just shot titties, so I mean, and we bottles, all say different things. <laughs> but no, I agree. Dave, you said something earlier where you said that um, you wished you had. I, I forget what it was about. You were grumpy about something from the past and you wish you'd just chilled out and gone with the flow. And I was the same way with several of the things that I did. I wish I had just embraced the moment and just enjoyed it because doing what we do, it's not just about us. Yes, we write a screenplay and then that screenplay is touched by two, 300 different people. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes something different. So we really start the process. And a lot of times, at least for me in the beginning, I thought that what I created wasn't being made and the, the public wasn't being able to experience that. And I felt bad about it. And then sometimes I felt embarrassed about it. Like it was my fault because I didn't fight harder. Or I didn't do more. Right. But the truth is it's, it's, it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. Enjoy the mm -hmm. journey, surround yourself with people you want to work with. I've, I've done this so long and worked the people I shouldn't have been working with that For I hated. Too long. They hated yeah. me. Yeah. Don't do that. Work with people you love yeah. and surround yourself with tools and, and you should be fine. And the other, another great piece, work with people who are more talented than you, especially if you're directing. Yeah. They're only going to make you look better. Yeah. That's the only reason I came onto this podcast. <laughs> the other thing is Dave, you talked about getting sidelined on house of the dead. You weren't involved in that production. See, every film I've made, I've had the writer on set with me. I've, I've maintained that collaboration all the way through the shoot, even into the editing. The, the I would, I, look, I would have, I would have had Scow on set, but they wouldn't fly him. They wouldn't fly yeah. him over. Of course yeah. not. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's not always possible, but, um, yeah, I just think that's so important to maintain that relationship when you're developing a project together, that should, mm -hmm. that should continue all the way through. The project, Absolutely. Whenever possible. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I mean, look, you write the movie three times. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So, we do. People are intimidated to jump on here. Intimid <laughs> yeah, I'm too scared. Uh, I'm not afraid to admit that. Um, Jeez. I think this is the scariest I've ever been. Then. <laughs> He's got a pink drill, for God's sake. Come on in, folks. <laughs> <laughs> M movie fan loves Jason X. Come on. Well, Come on. movie fan and I are twisted. <laughs> Um, Jason X has the greatest kill in the entire Friday the 13th uh, series. So. The the face salad it's, or the big screw? Oh, the face salad. The face in the cryogenic face kill is in gold. I, I I love the big screw too, especially when he starts sliding. Yeah, down. that's that's, that's that awesome was pretty too. great too. I yeah. love that one. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, my buddy Garrett says I have that weird House of the Dead like comedy director's cut edition. Is that a thing? It is the House of the Dead, the funny version. I have no idea. Didn't certainly didn't get paid for it. Never seen it. No idea what it is. I, wow. You know, never, it's never always good that. when a director mocks himself <laughs> and puts it out. I think, you know, it's like, there's a sign of a, a really talented genius. <laughs> uh, let's see. My buddy Nico says my buddy Valentine 3D and Valentine are event movies for me every year. Yay. Well, bless your heart. I'm glad that That's those... Awesome. I'm glad those movies have, you know, again, it's like, it's the, uh, the 20 year, the 20 year thing for some, you know, it's like that, you know, these things start like getting reassessed and it's like appreciated. It's like, Oh, you know, you were doing like, you know, some, you know, Italian Argento Giallo type shit with that movie that, you know, people just didn't yeah, it's weird how, get it. The time. The film not a frame of the film changes, but the, the reactions couldn't be more different. It's, it's really strange. Yeah, yeah. I'm really happy though. It's like, I'm glad the film has got fans. I, I got crushed when it, the, the readers of Fangoria magazine <laughs> voted Valentine, the worst movie of 2001. Oh, and what was the best, and what was damaged. the best movie? I, I, I was so damaged. I, I'm not kidding. I did not Google my name for about 10 years. I just didn't want to see any more negativity. You got to get over really, that. I, it really upset I, me. Yeah. 
You got to yeah. stop that. I, I've Googled my name three times tonight. Mostly it's my <laughs> naked ass, but <laughs> <laughs> I've Googled myself a lot. <laughs> oh, geez. Like, that is a good ass. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 contra it's a contractual obligation. Every movie Todd's in, <laughs> yeah, got to show his ass. Here, let me pan this camera down. <laughs> no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. His, his ass should have its own agents. <laughs> it should. Yeah. We we do have somebody. Somebody has been brave enough. All right. To, to join us in the green right. room. I'm going to bring him on. It's my buddy Chris. What's up, Chris? Hey. <laughs> do, you, do you have a question? For... I don't. I don't have a question. I just figured this was like a once in a lifetime thing. So, Chris, are you from I'm... Kentucky? Yeah, how'd you know, man? Is it the accent? I'm from Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. It's nice no. to meet you, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for uh, thanks for watching. Have you been watching this whole time? My yeah, God. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah, we've yeah, damn, we've been going for almost three hours. Holy wow! Crap. Yeah, I said yeah. a half hour, man. No. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Well, you know. No. I'll compensate you. <laughs> Time is money, right? So, how's life in Kentucky, Chris? Oh, uh, it's life in Kentucky. Yeah, you know that is. I hadn't uh, been back there in a while. You, you should come back, Todd. I should. Where are you, by the way? I'm or in. Can uh, you say that? I'm in the 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 southeastern part. All right. I was I was western Kentucky. Okay. We'll and meet in the middle, and I'll buy you a beer. Okay. Yeah. And Jeffrey Reddick's from Kentucky too. Yeah, where's right. Reddick from? I don't Reddick know. is uh, somewhere in there. <laughs> I think he's mid middle Kentucky. I think. I think he was. He's in there somewhere. Yeah. And you, so, you know, you Australians and Los Angelines are welcome as well. Well, I'm from the backwoods of Vermont. <laughs> well, that's true. So you're no. closer. <laughs> <laughs> than the than the outback. I don't know. Well, then the <laughs> outback. Yeah. <laughs> But Chris, I want to thank you for tuning in tonight and having the guts to jump on here yeah, in, in the in the in the lines den. Yeah, no and, problem. Um, yeah, so, but but uh, but thanks for for hanging out with us, and uh, I really appreciate it, man. Ain't no problem, man. It's my pleasure. I got to jump in here and be in a chat room with the guy who made a bunch of idiots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what'd you think of the new chainsaw? I loved it. Okay, good. It's everything I wanted. Not... Yeah. yeah. I had a blast. Yeah, me too. So did I. I that mean, was great fun. And I had a blast before I knew people were not having a blast. So, mm -hmm. I mean, don't, don't Todd, you'll start to get hate mail. <laughs> I'm okay with that, dude. I put Jason in fucking space. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait. It, it, it's about time that you know that 20 year thing, it right? Is. So people will go back and. You know, hate it more. Yeah, <laughs> no more. way. Oh, uh, geez. But Chris, seriously, thanks for hanging out, man. Have a good rest of your night, man. Thank All you, right, man. Appreciate it. Right thanks, on, Chris. Cheers, nice Chris. Bye. All right, cool. Chris, Chris stepped up. See, that's that's Kentucky. Chris right? from Kentucky. I got. It. I good like deal. that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I get a recommendation for you all, especially and and filmmakers too. So, it just came out this week. It's called Blood, Sweat, and Chrome. It's the making of Fury Road. It's oh, amazing. Great. It's amazing. Oh, I can't wait for that. It's so good. It's such a good it, book. It about... just came out or it's coming out? Oh, it just came out. Oh, I'm going to order it today. Yeah, uh, but it's really worth it. Talk oh. about a movie with that was experimental with no script. Good title. Yeah, you fantastic. Let's sweat the chrome. <clears throat> yeah, I was just about to order that James Cameron book with all these artworks. Oh, so yeah, yeah, from yeah. My Amazon order. I'll get both of them. Yeah. And Fincher's got, and then there's a new Fincher book too, that came out. I think I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Read books. That read. That that's stuff. the other thing. As a director and a Kentucky, writer, I read can't a read. lot. Got to read everything. Yeah, <laughs> that's read a, a lot. I read, read fiction <laughs> and nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Read a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's not true, Todd. Or else you couldn't write. <laughs> <laughs> I can write. I just can't read. I read stuff. Well, <laughs> so you they're, can, they're, he can listen to books. Thank you. There's definitely a book I'm looking forward to that's going to be coming out very soon. Mm. From, oh yeah, from, from Peter Brackey about all about what? '90s horror. So oh yeah. really? Peter I'm interviewed 200 people for this wow. book. Wow. 
Uh, he, he actually contacted me for an interview right before I was coming over to do the Blu-rays for Urban Legend and Valentine. I said to Pete, you can interview the whole cast for the Blu-rays and get all the interviews for your book. So um, we've become really good buddies. Oh, and, that's great. Yeah, I'm so look, looking forward to his book. But uh, there, there may be two of them, actually. He's got so much content, you might have to split it over two volumes. Wow. So um, it's exciting. Yeah. And he's a wonderful guy. He is. Todd, were you, nice up, were you up at uh, Universal when they did the the Crystal Lake Memories book release? Yeah. 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 I was there that I was there that night. That was crazy. I don't did I don't think we knew each other then. I don't think we knew each other. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The the big book signing when they had them all spread out. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, I would have yeah, loved yeah. to be in there for that. Oh, I would have too. That'd yeah, been it awesome. was really cool. Yeah, it was really cool. He uh he did, I mean you know, Peter and Kane, I would say, kept Friday the Thirteenth alive for a long time when right when it was dead. They did, yeah. they did, yeah. they did. So, um, good on he's them. a big part of that film's legacy. Pete. Yeah, good yeah, really for sure. I Absolutely. mean, but what's gonna? But now, what's gonna happen with that? Yeah, we don't know. Well, I mean, I mean, they're gonna have to come to some kind of arrangement. Otherwise, it just seems like it's a stalemate. It's not gonna yeah. go anywhere. Well, I did it's a. I, together. I did a stream with Larry Zerner and he broke it down. He said, even though, you know, um, the only way it's going to happen is if they, they get the two in a room together and they mm -hmm. have to come to some sort of agreement. And um, even though, you know, Victor owns his part and Sean owns his part. Well, again, it's going to be hard for Victor to get in the room. What? I, he passed away. Did he seriously pass away? Yeah. Really? When? Uh, I think I, I'm pretty sure it was like last year. He's yeah. posting stuff Victor on Twitter. Miller? Can't be. Oh, maybe not. I I, I, I thought he. No I, I thought there was something where it was just the Victor Miller okay. estate. Now I love that we're all on a freaking podcast and we're all googling right now. Victor <laughs> still alive. According according to Google, he's still alive. Okay. Uh, yeah, why no, did he's I, still I heard still something, but yeah, then they have to get into the room. We follow each other yeah. on Twitter. Okay, so he's got to be there. So yeah, they Victor. They, can I tell a Victor story? Please. Yeah. Oh, let me look him up. Let me look. Like you, you guys talk while I'm looking up. So let me find him first. Victor Miller, where is he? Where's the search on? Oh, there it is. Victor. Vic, are you guys waiting on me? To <laughs> yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're just watching you now. Seriously? Like, okay. So Victor some, Miller. He posted Victor time. Miller. Posted oh, okay. 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 Sorry, so guys. Vic, Victor follows 1,672 people. He has 1,613 followers. Yeah. Wow. He does not follow me, but I follow him. <laughs> so I'm thinking Victor don't fucking like the Jason X. That's what I'm thinking. I mean, that could mm. be a possibility. He's he's I probably mean, like, well, I didn't get paid for that thing. He did actually. He did. I saw that. Well, that's good. He did totally get paid for that. Crazy. So I don't. I don't blame him. The, there's so much bla bad blood between the two that it's it's just uh, Larry doesn't think it's going to happen until somebody eventually does pass away pass and he away. goes to goes to estates and then Justin, like it was that. my dream as a kid in the in my teens thinking oh one day i'll direct friday the 30th part 13 mm. and oh. the next one will be part 13 yeah if you count freddy versus jason so i i would I love wish, to do that i wish i had known then what i know now i wish i could have embraced the experience more right, right. if i'd known what I know now, I would have just been, I was so nervous. It was my first movie and I, I spent most of the time being stressed and full mm -hmm. of anxiety and just unhappy about everything. And that was just stupid. I should have had fun with it. So, yeah. Yeah. But you know, business. other people were probably putting some of that pressure and stress on you as well. It's true. I mean, yes, but at the same time, you know, it's just, I, I look back at that with regret and I try not to live with regret, but still it's, it's a tough one. I wish I had, mm. I wish I had enjoyed that more than I did. Right. Although yeah. going to Universal Studios to see, you know, opening week with seven other people and no one else in the theater, it certainly did take away from the experience. Mm. <laughs> well, <laughs> did any of them walk out? Because when I went and saw House no, of the Dead. they all stayed. Yeah. So opening night of House of the Dead, I go to Burbank to a sold out theater and watch half the audience walk out before the halfway point. Of the movie. Oh, oh. And I already knew how bad it was. But it was just oh, like, man. My oh, friends were like, you got to go. It's opening in the theater. This is a big deal. And I was like, oh, my oh God. no. That's what I meant before. My, my, we'll my have a comment. drink. It's like it's hard enough making the movie 
<laughs> but dealing with the fallout afterwards in all its different forms is yeah. it can be really tough. It can hurt you. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh man. But this well, is I don't this... know about you. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Todd, please. No, you're smarter than me. Talk. Well, I don't I don't know about that. I I'm intimidated by you, honestly. Um so I, I, I was just going to say how awesome this has been to, to talk it to Dave been, and then to bring been. you guys on. Oh, and this has been great. To, to, I've loved the stream. I was there from the very beginning, guys. It was wow. Dave, you were fantastic to listen Thank to. Thank you. Uh, no, I, it's such a you pleasure. You took me on a journey, man. You really did. It was lovely. Mm. I, lovely. I, I, already, lovely. I already wrote you an email that I'm going to send as soon as this is over. Oh, right on. Because <laughs> oh. I enjoyed it that much. Thanks, dude. No, screw that. I'm going to send it right now. <laughs> but yeah this has been it. so much it's been so much fun dave thank you so much for being so candid and for you know sticking yeah, out with me um it's wow, been thank uh, you terrific wow, it's, it's been great. an absolute pleasure and, and todd and jamie thank you guys for jumping on too i i, I appreciate it. it's always good to see your both of y'all's beautiful smiling faces i love thanks. to see you justin anytime any yeah, any any day my friend yeah Absolutely. thanks for having us justin and dave yeah we're sorry for crashing your. your no, your I'm glad you guys did. No, it's been great. Uh, you know, I haven't, you know, I haven't seen Jamie in over oh, a yes. decade, and I haven't seen you yeah. in a couple of years. So this is that's great, great, man. Yeah, so, it's lovely. It's been lovely. That's, and that's what we do here on my channel. I bring people together. <laughs> you are the oh, you are the Oprah of horror. I'm the Oprah of horror. <laughs> Just you get a car, and you get a car, and you. <laughs> Well, and you get a photo of Todd's of bare ass. And you get a photo of Todd's bare ass. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jamie. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I said you've done a lot for me, as you know. So your channel's wonderful. I've got a lot of, a lot of love and respect for it, brother. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Todd's Todd's feeling. He's, he's, he's tearing up over there. I feel so emotional right now. <laughs> <laughs> um. But if, if, if you guys have a couple of minutes to, to stick around until after uh, when we go off the air, um, please do so. Of course. But, yeah. um, all right. So I'm going to I'm going to wrap it up there. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me tonight. It's been such a such a fun show. Um, shout out to my buddy Nico for the ten dollar super chat. I appreciate that very much. Shout out to Booster Seat for the two, four, six, eight dollars. I appreciate that very much, my friend. Uh, let's see you still with me tonight. We've got uh, my buddy Christian's in the house, my buddy Tim, movie fan, Michael Parker, Dying Breed, Rootsman, Sean Sr., Slasher Home Video, who was Chris, who jumped on with us for a short time. I can't believe night. my brother stayed on for three hours. <laughs> what, which, who's your, who's your brother? My, Michael Parker. Michael Parker. <laughs> Michael Parker. Don't bring him on. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> He, he, he had fun too. So thank Good. you, Michael, for hanging out with us. Uh, we had the great Rolf Konevsky hanging out yeah, tonight. Awesome. Man. Thank you for hanging out with us tonight, Rolf. That was very nice. Uh, uh, very, very cool. Uh, there's my buddy, Nico. Uh -oh. He broke his own stream. I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, he's frozen. <laughs> he froze. We're here. Justin. Hey, look, we're dealing with Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> We just don't know what will happen. No. <laughs> we'll just be here all night waiting for you to come back up. <laughs> <laughs> we could still be streaming, so don't say anything you don't need to say. Oh, That's I think right. we are. <laughs> yeah. It is. It's still going on. Is it, are you watching both? Because I had to turn the other down because my brain was about yeah, to Yeah, I turned the other me, one down, but check. yeah, we're still on. All right. That's good. Check is he other... still frozen? He oh, is still frozen. That's lovely. You know, watching him tonight makes me want to put a fireplace right here. I think <laughs> I could do that. You all, you I do one think in. I oh, could do that. Now, he, now he's gone, so I think... Uh, Let me, I'm just checking so the we're the only. So, <clears throat> so thanks, everyone, oh, wait, for now, showing no, up. He's tonight. gone, but we're still on. <laughs> yeah, we're still on. So We've taken on. over. We've taken over. Now. All right. So thanks, for everyone, for, for joining the Bloodcast tonight. Yes. Really appreciate it. We had a blast. <laughs> How many DVDs do you have? Do you like keep? Whoa. <laughs> Holy shit. Do you like actually have the count? Soft. You do, right? No, I wouldn't have a clue how many there there are on the shelves. I well, guess I don't need you to count those shelves and average it out, but who knows? Good lord. Sorry about Justice that, guys. Back. I my, my my internet sputtered there for a minute. 
and, and yet um, still kept us on. It still, I it still kept you on. Yeah, we kept so the show going for you, brother. We yeah, yeah. Todd food. dropped his uh, pants. Oh, he froze again. <laughs> <Twice>. <laughs> he froze again. <laughs> oh man! All right. <laughs> I guess I got to drop the pants again. <laughs> okay, we're back. I think we're back. <laughs> I think we're, all right, let, let me end it while I'm here yeah. before okay. my internet messes up again. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, guys. Watch. Pleasure, it's been man. great. Thank you all. Take care. We'll see you again very, very soon. Cheers.